Hello and welcome to episode 320 of Retro Encounter, RPG Fans Weekly Podcast of Many Topics. I'm Mike Solosi, and as you can see from the title, this is going to be a somewhat unusual episode of Retro Encounter, but before we get to that, let's introduce the panel, starting with Jonathan Logan. Hello, everyone. And Dom Kim. Hello, everyone. And not one, but two newcomers to Retro Encounter. First, Abraham Koblianski. Oh yeah, finally made it. <laughs> and Stephen Matter. Hello, everyone. So, John Dom, Steve, Abe, uh, this episode is not about RPGs. That is, in Wait, fact, what? the title. <laughs> Indeed. That is, in fact, the title of an episode that we did in 2019, and we are bringing back that format. Uh, it's been three years, and I don't remember a time before March of 2020, so it's going to all seem fresh and new to me. But uh, just just in case, I did listen to that old episode uh, just a few days ago, and on that episode, we talked about. 12 different genres or series that weren't RPGs but matter a lot to the four panelists on that episode. I personally discussed Mega Man, uh, Civilization, and Guitaru Man on that episode. So that was complete a complete delight for me, of course. Mm. And My favorite maybe- part of it was when we heard about the darkness deep in Alana's soul. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, apparently, <laughs> Alana has had some very troubling times with The Sims over the years. But uh, if you want to listen to that episode, you can find it on our archive, uh, either your podcast feed or RPGFan.com are ways to find that old episode. It's number 171, and it aired in, I, in, I think, January of 2019. But we're not going to live in the past. We're living in the present and then looking back to the past a little bit. Um, uh, each of the five of us has chosen two topics to discuss. Uh, that is going to be either a genre of game or a particular series or a particular developer. And we're just going to have a roundtable discussion of each of them having fun, reminiscing and recommending and uh, and discussing. Before we jump into it, um, I should mention that we did discuss what topics we're, we're doing ahead of time, but not all of them. I, I vetted the, everyone's ideas to make sure that there wasn't any conflict or repeat, but most for most of this episode, the panelists don't know what the other panelists have chosen. So that, that's going to be a, a fun, spontaneous surprise here. So uh, with I guess without further ado, uh, does anyone mind if I go first? Please. Go for it. By all means. Go ahead. All right. Uh, fighting games. I have been playing fighters for many, many years, since I was six or seven years old, and I first found a, I, I think it was an arcade machine of either Fatal Fury 2 or Fatal Fury 3 at the, uh, at a, at the basement of a hotel where my family was staying for a vacation. Uh, but I'm not here to talk about SNK fighters, even though I love many of those dealer- dearly. I really got into fighting games in the 90s playing Street Fighter 2 with my sort of little collection of elementary school friends around the time. And my love for Street Fighter has endured over the years, um, and not just Street Fighter, but with Capcom's suite of fighting games. I've tracked down and emulated weird ones. Uh, I got really deep into into Capcom beat-em-ups as a result, playing even the, the, the Dungeons & Dragons ones from the late 80s and Battle Circuit from 97 or 98, which is quietly their best, the best one they've ever made, but not enough people have played it. But sticking to fighting games, um, I've played every generation of Street Fighter. I subscribe to a couple of YouTube channels that show Street Fighter highlights, and I watch those every week. I am just a big Street Fighter fan, and I can even I can even get into weird Street Fighter story stuff that absolutely no one cares about, if you let me. So uh, maybe Street Fighter in particular, Capcom fighters in, uh, in general, are among my favorite kinds of video games. And uh, yeah, opens up to the floor. What what kind of what's the Street Fighter or Capcom fighting experience of each of y'all? Um, well, I just have very very casual knowledge of street fighter four and five i played it a bit in the dorms in high school with the shared console that we had but yeah i have to say my knowledge of fighting games is a bit limited in this area street fighter four came out on console uh right when i was finishing college and i i i was the president of the gaming club at the time we i hosted a couple street fighter four tournaments and uh, I, I I did okay in them. I, I I would enter the tournament and win a couple, and then lose to the people that were really good at Street Fighter. Uh, it basically was my Street Fighter Four playing experience in college. But um, uh, I but you know when we had Retro Nights, I could you know I could dominate at Capcom versus SNK two al- along with the best of them. My experience started uh, when I was uh, very young. There was a convenience store very close to where I lived called Westside 
convenience store. And some, I, I used to go there to buy candy and stuff when I was little. And somehow they got their hands on a Street Fighter arcade game. And this was back in, I mean, it would have been about a year after it was released uh, in arcades. And I would spend so much time there, not even playing it, but watching people play it. Uh, and then, of course, I was very small at the time. So I was never at the front of the line and always the bigger kids were standing there. But then I remember the incredible level of excitement when it came out for the Super Nintendo. Uh, and, uh, I, I rented it guess where, but, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I really like, uh, I really like street fighter games. Mind you, I'm not good at them. Uh, I have no real talent when it comes to fighting games, but I do enjoy them and, uh, they are very fun to watch, especially if you see someone who is actually like extremely good at, I mean, it's a sport. I mean, yeah, I think it, I mean, I love fight, uh, fighting games as a spectator sport. I'm not hugely into watching speed runs. Or or streamers of really any kind of video game. It, I mean, it's just that's more about my personality. I like I like I like the the playing experience of a game to be private and then talk about it on a podcast afterwards, unless I'm playing a multiplayer game. But Street Fighter or fighting games in general are just amazing as spectator sports because if you're familiar with fighters and know about the exactly how much skill goes into those combos and those strategies, then watching the best people in the world playing them is fascinating I, again I, I watch evo every year or, or before it shut down for very legitimate reasons and i subscribe to a couple uh youtube channels that show high level street fighter play the best one is fight club tv which focuses on street fighter 5 uh a game that has had problems over the years but is uh but is definitely an entertaining game to watch at least well similar to you guys i uh i also got into uh, street fighter 2 through the uh the super nintendo um got in some heated uh fights with my friends <laughs> uh not just on the console of course uh yeah so i'm uh i remember the eight world eight original world warriors <laughs> um i'm relatively uh new to following the series i haven't played much of any of it i played a little bit of four but not a whole lot and i redeemed um five when it came out on playstation plus but I I mostly watch five and a little bit of four here and there. Um, getting into the series, I guess the the backlog of the series, you know, before four was or before five, I should say, um, was a little intimidating to me because there are so many versions of each game to where I don't really know where to start with each of them. If that makes sense. Yes, it makes sense. Um, I mean, it like. Paying attention to Street Fighter story is mostly like watching arcade endings and reading the manuals a couple times. It, it, it's it's not worth investing a lot of brain real estate in. But uh, th- th- there are ways yeah. to uh, to play the and almost all of the versions. Um, my favorite thing, or I don't know if this is a favorite, but uh, the last version of Street Fighter Two before the uh, um, before it was remade in the two thousands was called Hyper Fighting, and it had a I think it had a a PlayStation one version. And in that you could choose which version of your street fighter character you were playing. So you could have like original street fighter two Ryu versus super turbo Sagat in, in, in that game. And, and famously uh, the, the super turbo characters had super moves, but some of the older versions had better priority or higher damage on their moves. And, and, uh, and famously old Sagat's fireballs were so fast that it was by far the best, the, the original street fighter two version of Sagat was by far the best version in that mix and match version of street fighter 2 but it, like again um I, I, I will probably play capcom fighting games forever i haven't played a ton of street fighter 5 but i've watched so much of it that i feel like i know what the meta feels like some uh some of the time at least so and and my my love for that sub genre sub series or spread out into other series uh i don't even know what the right noun for it is but i i when a street fighter 6 happens and especially if a Capcom versus SNK three happens, I will be back for it. I, I do wonder how like the older Street Fighter games would play for uh, like a, a younger generation who hasn't played them and only has uh, maybe played you know four or five. I'd be curious to see what they think. <laughs> what games were included in the thirtieth uh, anniversary uh, edition? I, I believe it has Hyper Fighting, um, Alpha One, Two, and Three, uh, Third Strike, and I think that's about it. Uh, of those, what would you recommend the most? That's a, if any of them. That's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Definitely not Street Fighter One. You could just sk- skip yeah. Street Fighter One straight up. Uh, 
Street Fighter Alpha 3 has uh, an incredibly diverse character select screen and multiple ways of uh, of manipulating super meter, and that's cool. And sort of uh, like an but, RPG mode. A little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. There, there is a story mode with an, that lets you sort of uh, level up and give your character give your character extra skills. It's fun to mess around with, but and, but also Third Strike. I mean, Street Fighter Three Third Strike still looks amazing and plays amazing. Oh, it, it, its meta game is so set that it's basically a solved game in terms of like who the best characters are and and what you need to do to win in, in like the highest level tournament scenes. But it's it's a that's a beautiful hardcore version of Street Fighter. But uh, yeah, that 30th anniversary collection is a very good value if you want some Street Fighter education. But I, I think we're, we've done enough Street Fighter educating already today. Uh, uh, Dom, let's, let's give uh, go ahead with your first topic. Okay, um, so it's going to be none other than probably my favorite indie game of all time, which is Hollow Knight. And um, Hollow Knight came out in February of 2017, I believe, by the made by the two men team of team cherry and with um additional support in music from what's the composer's name but yeah <laughs> anyway they do team uh, hollow knight was from what i can gather it was made by two people and i actually didn't pick it up until december 2017 when it was on the winter sale as you do and um it was actually just like by like pure chance that i got to play it it was just, you know, the first on my list, just sort of alphabetically in the games that I picked up. And yeah, I ended up sinking in, I think, like 80 hours into it. And Hollow Knight really, um, I mean, for those who have listened to me or read my reviews, I am a big fan of Dark Souls, the series as a whole. And I really dig the vibe and atmosphere. And Hollow Knight really has that in spades. And it also... And um, but it also introduced me to um, the Metroidvania and platformer genre. And yeah, after playing Hollow Knight, I've also um, branched out a lot into that genre. I've played stuff like um, Owlboy and uh, most recently Ender Lilies. And I've also like found a really uh, nice new genre to dig my teeth into thanks to that. Now, Hollow Knight's a bit of a curious question about RPG fan coverage, because we've had people ask our editor-in-chief, Mike Salvato, if we could cover Hollow Knight multiple times in the past. Indeed. Uh, Several included. people on this podcast do that. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, um, I know uh, Dom and Jono, both of you are among those. Uh, Alana is also a big Hollow Knight fan, eager to play Silk Song, and has asked about covering it. And even though it has... A, a lot of uh, inspiration from Souls Likes, which is a genre that we mostly cover, and Metroidvania is another genre that we mostly cover. Uh, Dom, you mentioned Ender Lilies. That's the game we have a review on, mm-hmm. on, on the site from 2021. Uh, despite those, it's we, or maybe mostly Mike, ultimately decided that it doesn't have enough RPG elements for us to cover it a lot, which is too bad, but now, which makes this episode the perfect opportunity to talk about it. Indeed, which is why I'm excited to be here. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's incredible. I think it's the best Metroidvania released in the last five years, and that includes the recent Metroid Dread. Um, I love it. I think it's a masterpiece of art design, of music, mm-hmm. of environmental storytelling, of evolving the genre of Metroidvanias uh, in very creative ways. The lore of the game is absolutely masterful. The way that it drips out information about this incredible world. The fact that every creature even the most horrifying disgusting ones are kind of disturbingly cute uh <laughs> yeah i I, I just think it's yeah. i just think it's one of the best i think it's one of the best games ever made and i think the one of the most impressive things about it is the fact that the bloody developers keep releasing more and more and more of it like mm-hmm. you buy hollow knight that's just the start like you get so mi- so much more content how much dlc was in the what they call it the void heart edition I think it was everything. Um, I, I think there's only one piece of official DLC for it, but they, I think they added like extra to it after like post release. There's according to this anyway. There's the Grim Troop and the Godmaster, mm-hmm. but like, it's a lot of content. Yeah, it's not quite as much as like Shovel Knight, the other Knight game, but it's it's a lot. 
Shovel Knight has so much extra content that it's it, it's cross genre and game and developer. It, it, it it's not almost not fair talking about it. But I, I have not played Hollow Knight. I I own it and it's been sitting in my game library unplayed, taunting me at, since I want to say 2018, but I, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, so I I really should get around to it. I, I don't know if when that'll happen. But uh, help me a little bit here. This game is. The, the, the characters in it are somewhat insectoid. They, they, they're they sort of cute um, anthropomorphized creatures that either resemble insects or resemble little people with insect sort of exoskeletons as armor and masks. Is that mm-hmm. fair? That is correct. Yes, that is. I'd say that's a pretty fair assessment. <laughs> it's a, it's a hell of a look. Do. Yeah, it really is. Um, they're, and you're, they are adorable, but at the same time, there is a, uh, a certain uh, bug-like sense to them, which is important because it is, you know, it takes place in Hollow Nest, as it's called, which is this kind of like, it's, it's an ancient kingdom that has fallen into ruin. And, oh, that's another thing that is masterful about this thing, the environments. Um, every biome, it, it just feels like its own individual world with its own societies and uh, the tone of it all is just amazing, especially when mixed with the music. Like, there's so much. Like, there are parts of this game that could make you weep without when nothing is happening. Yeah, you that, could just be standing there. The ambience of the game is great, especially. Um, I remember when I first got to the City of Tears, I just sat on a bench, just listening to the music and the mm. ambience of the raindrops for like a good like ten, fifteen minutes. <laughs> oh yeah and i have yeah it's just yeah i feel it's just as john said it's masterful in, in its environmental storytelling and just I, getting the player to invest themselves into the environment naturally so that even the like the very minimalistic like minute by minute story is like it's not a big deal because you're so invested into the world and the lore that um you just want to naturally know more about it and I think that's mm. a, I guess that's a bit of a detractor. Uh, from what I understand, they didn't quite meet um, their Kickstarter goals towards the end, which is why some of the end game areas feel a, feel a little bit unfinished. But that's like, that's nothing. I feel in the in the bigger picture, in the grand scheme of things. I, I, I think they the the Kickstarter was a mild success, but the, but the game itself didn't really explode until it got its uh, console versions about a year after the PC version came out. So it, it, there there was a spike in popularity of of Hollow Knight about a year after its initial release, which I think is when I got it. And uh, I should probably mention the person who's been the number one advocate of Hollow Knight to me in my uh, you know of, of of the people I know is definitely former host of Random Encounter Rob Steinman. Which I, I think if if Hollow Knight came out while he was still on staff, he would have used his um, uh, you know, through f- through pure anger, he would have written a review of it, <laughs> it on the website. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's a big fan as well. Yeah. Um, uh, a- Abe or Steven, have you played Hollow Knight, or at least have some thoughts about it? Um, I have not. Uh, like you, it has also been sitting in my library for not quite as long. Um, but I can say from what I have seen of it, it looks beautiful. I love the uh, way it uses blacks and other dark tone colors um, and contrast that with the primarily white colored characters, like the main character, for example. Um, I haven't listened to any of the music, so I can't really um, judge it on that merit from a, from a person who hasn't played it yet. But um, just the way the art looks and I hear it controls really well has kind of made me want to play it at some point. I think whenever... Um, Silk Song actually gets a release date is when I'll finally be pushed to play. So it. you're never going to play it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I have no idea. Oh, <laughs> Are no. they going to release that game? We'll find out. Uh, it does look gorgeous. Uh, I am, I am not a huge uh, 2D platformer fan. Uh, I may, may may be making myself a target on this website, <laughs> but uh, no, yeah, <laughs> it's just yeah, not not really my thing. It's. I mean, one word of warning to anyone, it's not easy. Like, it's it has pulled a lot of uh, inspiration from Dark Souls. It is a hard, hard Metroidvania game. Like, if you are not, you are not going to be able to beat most bosses your first couple of times playing it. You need to figure out patterns, go back, grind. Like, it's it's a challenge, but it's one of those games where I've played, 
I play games like that where by I'm, the challenge just annoys me. But I was never annoyed by Hollow Knight at any point. Um, I was always engaged in what was happening. Uh, it's like I mean I have and the music I have two I have two soundtracks of it on my phone. I have the actual soundtrack and I have a piano version of it. Um, and they are they I've worked many a day to using those as like quote unquote study music um, because they're it's just perfect for that. Um, it's just such a vibe. And, and to answer Dom's question from earlier in the episode, uh, the soundtrack for Hollow Knight was composed by Christopher Larkin. Yes, and of and he is al- he is also the composer for Silk Song, uh, which is coming out TBD, mm-hmm. and hopefully that does not become the the like you know the, the vaporware target of mockery <laughs> of uh, for twenty twenty two and beyond. Now now that Halo Infinite's out, I think it'll be fine. I mean, the thing about Silk Song that people are forgetting is that originally it was supposed to be a piece of DLC. It was supposed to be the third piece of DLC for Hollow Knight. And then they were building it and they were working on it and they realized, ah, we have another game here. It's, it plays completely different because there's a completely different main character. We should just spin this off into its own game. And I imagine at that point, they went back to the start to rework it. And that's one of the reasons it's taking so long. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's fine. I think it's worth it. I would love to get it in 2022. I think I'm more excited to find out what form they're going to use to announce it because every time there's a nintendo direct everyone gets really excited every time there's like a show everyone gets really excited so i'm just kind of pumped to see what they finally choose uh as the as the launch for this thing's uh uh final trailer you're going to be excited until it's announced as an amazon luna exclusive for the first year no 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 i remember (laughs) i don't think last year when they did the when silk song appeared on what was it? I think it was like a Eurogame, like a cover for a Eurogamer. Mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever been baited harder in my life. Oh, I remember than that at that moment. <laughs> what was the story that they had on that? They, it was just like uh, some snippets about its development. Is this is this it? Is this the release date announcement? And it was like no. Nope. Okay, so it was like an interview nope. without really the news bite that people wanted. Yep. Mm. Yeah, oh, it gosh. was a, it was a bit of a controversy. <laughs> that sounds that sounds like a masterful yeah. date if there ever was one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they have to be very careful about what they say, which is why they have been saying absolutely mm-hmm. nothing about it. <laughs> because anything that they say about the game or alluding to the game is going to get people running. Oh, just just a, just a closing note. Um, Hollow Knight is also fantastic value. Um, currently, I believe it's like fifteen dollars on Steam. And I don't think you can find a better value game for that price point than Hollow Knight. <laughs> yeah, in I my agree opinion. with that. I, I, I can actually. Shovel Knight does offer a better value, but not by much. <laughs> All right. Well, no matter what night you decide to play in advance of Silk Song, uh, my Amazon Luna is ready to go for when that happens. Uh, uh, John, let's have you go next. What is the developer-focused topic you wanted to bring to the table? Yeah, so uh, over the holidays, and I'm by the holidays, I'm just going to include December in that. Uh, I started playing Control, uh, which is a game by Remedy Entertainment that got released a few years ago um, about the Federal Bureau of Control, uh, which is a federal agency dedicated to basically the supernatural. And I kind of just started it on a whim. I, I got it for free on, uh, I got it for free on one of the Epic uh, Games giveaway things. And I almost instantly fell in love with it. I just was absolutely blown away by this game. Um, the atmosphere, the design, the storytelling, the actors, the actors especially, uh, just drew me into this world. And then I started doing a little bit of research and realized that, well, for first off, obviously, it wasn't their first game. They've done many others. But also, uh, they kept referencing some of their previous games in uh, lore dumps and pieces of uh, documents that you find around the world, uh, including Alan Wake, uh, which is a, a game that many people probably know now based on the announcement of Alan Wake 2 uh, a few weeks ago at the Game Awards. So I said, you know what, I'm going to put Control on hold and I'm going to go back and I'm going to play Alan Wake. Uh, so I bought Alan Wake, uh, the remaster, and I played it and I loved it. And then I played its sequel semi-sequel and liked it and then i played their next game quantum break which is like a time travel adventure and as a fan of time travel i also adored it and then i finished control and now i'm just itching for alan wake 2 so 
The reason why I think Remedy, I'm, I'm just focusing on their more recent games. Uh, some people might know Remedy Entertainment based on uh, the Max Payne series, which is sort of what they built their reputation on uh, in the very early 2000s, uh, Max Payne and Max Payne 2. And uh, then they released Alan Wake, God, years later. And the, the gentleman behind uh, most of their games, the concept and the writing is, is named Sam Lake. Uh, there, he's, uh, he's Finnish and it's a Finnish company. And he kind of seems like he wants to be David Lynch. Uh, Alan Wake is very much, it's as close to Twin Peaks, the video game, as I think we're ever going to get. Um, It is about an author and his wife, and he has had, this author has had writer's block for years. So his wife uh, books a cabin in this small little town uh, and they go to it. And one night she is, uh, uh, his wife is kidnapped and immediately he wakes up on the side of the road in a car crash with no memory of what happened for a full week. Uh, and he must piece it together. And he discovers that in the darkness, there are human shaped, uh, I guess they're possessed by something. And the only weapons he has are like light firearms and a flashlight. And in order to kill these things, he needs to shine his flashlight on them for a period to get rid of their armor. And then he needs to take them out. Now, it's a terrible combat system. I hate it, but the story drew me in so hard that I, I kept playing it. I kept pushing past it. Um, Quantum Break uh, advanced the uh, combat quite a bit with some time travel powers. It stars, uh, oh God, who does it star? Um, uh, uh, Sean Ashmore. I knew it was one of the Ashmores. I couldn't remember which one it was. Um, and it's, you know, there's video capture and everything. And, uh, when I was playing it, I realized it was also referencing Alan Wake. And then I, I started noticing like references that were in control later. It, I'm getting a little in over my head. The point is this is a company, all of their games seem to take place in the same universe, but they are very isolated. They, they don't have anything to do with each other, uh, just packed full of references. And they use a lot of the same actors in all of their projects, um, which gives them kind of like this repertory company sort of feel. Uh, and as a, as someone who came to the theater, came from the theater, I really like that. And their actors are really, really great. Like some of the actors, uh, Courtney Hope, for example, plays uh, uh, Jesse Faden in Control, who's the main character. And she also plays a, a completely unrelated character named Beth Wilder in Quantum Break. Uh, uh, James uh, McCaffrey, who played the title character in Match, Max Payne, and he also plays the director in control uh uh i can't pronounce his i don't think i is it matthew Por, Peretta? yeah matthew Peretta uh plays the voice of uh, alan wake but he also plays a character dr casper darling in control so all of these games are, are are deeply interconnected they're all weird they're all strange they all have unexplored mysteries they all explore uh the underbelly of what's normal uh which really suits my tastes and it very much feels like if if David Lynch was a video game director, first off, that would be amazing. But second off, these are like the kind of games I feel like he would be making. Um, yeah, I just, I just love them. I, I was, I, I had a really, really great December of gaming playing through all of their recent titles, uh, and I cannot wait for Max Payne or for Max Payne for uh, Alan Wake uh, Two to come out at some point in 2023. I think. Have you gotten around to playing Controls? Um, yes, I played all of it. So yeah, the. Yeah, there, okay. there's the second DLC is entirely like a midquel to uh, Alan Wake, which is really, really neat. Huh. Yeah, um, I played uh, a bit of Quantum Break. I played about half and I really enjoyed um, what I did play, but I guess something else came up and I never got around to finishing it. Um, although I, I felt like the... Um, like something that Quantum Break and uh, Control share is the psychokinetic power mm-hmm. uh, angle that they have to the game's combat. I think it's a lot better in Control uh, from what I've seen of it. I have yet to play Control, but I have it both on Epic Games and on uh, PlayStation because it was offered on PS Plus um, January mm-hmm. of last year. So I will get around to playing it at some point. Hopefully soon. Um, I don't have a whole lot of interest in Alan Wake, though. I was close to covering it on another site I write for. 
Um, but it didn't really pique my interest all that much due to what people said about the uh, combat in the original version. I'm not going to lie. The combat drove me so crazy that eventually I downloaded a trainer to give me unlimited flashlight power. Um, and that improved the quality of the well. game measurably <laughs> um, because it uh, all of a sudden I could focus on the story, which I adored. And it still had a challenge to it. It was not easy, but it, it eliminated one of the more annoying parts of the game or at least mitigated it. Um, the story is so good in it. Um, I, I just love the story of it. Uh, and Control, you're right. The combat in these games is not fantastic. It's good in Control. It's fine. Uh, in Quantum Break, it's a long way from Alan Wake. But still, that's not the reason I would recommend playing these games if you're looking for a really, really good uh, combat system. You're playing these games for the atmosphere, for the acting, for the character, the stories, uh, and the interconnectedness of it all. It's written in the stars. <laughs> <laughs> it's cosmic as yeah. David Lynch would say maybe <laughs> uh, all of those games are on my backlog The uh, ever since uh, Alan Wake <laughs> but uh, just haven't found time to sit down for those I'm excited though yeah if anyone's if anyone's curious or listening or anyone on this podcast uh, I would try to do what I did which is I would download Control because it is their latest game it's their most polished and probably has the best combat in it. And if you end up digging the world and digging that style uh, that uh, Sam Lake brings to it, then I would recommend you go back and play some of the other games. Um, like, I know Alan Wake just got a remaster, and it's a pretty good remaster, too. It doesn't change that much of the game, but it does polish a few things. So obviously, play that version. Um, but yeah, play Control first uh, and see if it's your see if it's your jam, if you really get into it. And if not, no, there's no problem with that. It's just not your thing. But I, I really just dug these games hard when i i started playing them control is the one that interests me the most i i haven't played any of them but i i own a couple of them from various sales or uh, or ps plus shenanigans but uh, the control having the concept of you know similar to an x files or even a men in black where something that is decidedly not government slash corporate is sort of given a government corporate setting like it's like control is almost about everyday objects taking on magical properties like instead of some magical sword of legend that uh that that is you know central to a storyline it's there's, a fridge yeah there's a warehouse <laughs> with, with a refrigerator or a toaster that has supernatural elements to it and you have to and and the, the the fridge is going haywire and you have to go investigate it like that but but it's also in like but it also sort of makes fun of bureaucracy the in a, in a way that um, that I guess men in black sort of does like that whole concept is hilarious to me and also has a lot of potential to me. And the fact that it has some pretty intriguing, uh, psychokinetic power gameplay for its sort of, for its combat and interactivity, that sounds just really cool to me. I, I, uh, avoided playing it on PS4 because I heard that it, uh, that it ran very poorly. Like it just, it just, you know, chugged the hell out of the system. But if I were able to uh, improve my PC and try it there, hmm. or maybe or or maybe try it on my PS5, I think it, it, I think that would be a good opportunity for it. But it's uh, the, the Remedy Studio games. I've heard them being discussed on podcasts and websites for probably over a decade by now, and uh, and they they sound really interesting and fascinating for all the reasons that Jono established earlier. But I, I have not gotten around to any of them. Hmm. I mean, I played it on my. I played it on my computer, so uh, that's a 1070 Ti, so hardly top of the line, and it played very well. Like I, it, w it handled it perfectly well. Obviously, not maxed out or anything like that, but I had great frame rates. Uh, the game still looked really, really good. Um, I'm not sure how it would play on PlayStation 4. I would hope at this point it would be optimized a little bit better. But yeah, I famously it ran sort of poorly. But I, uh, mm. but I, I, again, like people would say that their PS4 sounded like a jet engine trying to run it. Well, that's that's really any game. Any point. any game any game made after <laughs> let's say God of War twenty eighteen has has probably the similar complaint. Yeah, and I I agree with you, Mike. Like I like the idea of the mundane mixed with the what, what's underneath the mundane, the supernatural kind of thing, and the way that this game handles it with it being kind of like a nondescript, vaguely nineteen seventies eighties looking uh, agency kind of thing. Uh, but mixed with all of this bizarre weirdness. And it's just the fact that this is these people's jobs. Like they're not, 
they're not freaked out by this. They're not weirded out by all of the the strangeness of the supernatural. It's just kind of like, you know, another bureaucratic day in the office, but this one involves a possessed fridge. Uh, it's, it's a really nice juxtaposition and it makes for some entertaining, uh, entertaining stories. All right. So that was, uh, Jono's thoughts on his uh, recent run into the oeuvre of Remedy Studio. Uh, now let's talk about a single series made by a single developer that has had some ups and downs over the years. Uh, Abe, let's talk about Metal Gear. <laughs> it's not entirely a single developer anymore. There was uh, the the Metal Gear Survive the, uh, just a few years oh, ago no. that was done kind of I thought without... we didn't talk about that. Metal Gear Survive is the Philips CDI Zelda game of, <laughs> of Metal Gear Solid. It's, uh, it's Metal Gear Solid with zombies. Uh, uh, so yeah, Metal Gear Solid, uh, as the box says, it's a, it's a, uh, tactical espionage action. So sipping that tea there. Um, so, uh, when it, it, this game came out in 1998 and I was, uh, I was about 14 years old. Um, and the, uh, you know, it, this game blew my mind because of the, uh, the, the, uh, the cinematic presentation of, of this game. I, I feel like this was possibly like the beginning of, of cinematic games. Uh, and I'm talking about, uh, you know, cinematic is done like in engine versus, you know, full motion video, which, which was uh, in danger of becoming the thing back in the, back in the nineties. Um, I, I kind of imagine a parallel universe where FMV became the thing. And <laughs> it's kind of, kind of sounds sad and, and cold. <laughs> um, so, Metal Gear Solid is a uh, it's a stealth game. Uh, there's I know there's there's a few other uh, stealth uh, series now that that kind of sprung from it. Um, you know there's Assassin's Creed and uh, some of what some of those games we cover. And uh, I, I think I think Ten I think Ten Chu came out around the same time as oh, Metal Gear Chu, Solid. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, but Metal Gear I mean I mean Metal Gear Solid had Metal Gear almost a decade earlier. So it's it's not like it. I don't think either of them was was mimicking the other. But uh, but but yeah, Metal Gear Solid has sort of been the standard stealth action game for a long time. Yeah, and I, I definitely think that uh, you know, like Hitman and, and Assassin's Creed are very different, uh, very different series in terms of stealth. But uh, Metal Gear Solid is is a little bit of a, an original. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so this is a stealth game, which is uh, you know, it's it's pretty much an uh, action adventure game, except that. Uh, you're absolutely beholden to uh, you know needing to stealth your way through levels instead of uh, fighting your way through them. Um, the, some of the later the games in the series allowed you to give you a little bit more of an open option as to whether you wanted to fight your way through or 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 uh, you know just run run your way through sometimes. Um, but yeah, Metal Gear Solid, and if you um, so you, you can't you pretty much can't advance if if uh, you have the uh, if the enemies know that you're there you can't advance to the next uh, story beat. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a little bit different from the typical action uh, action game. And uh, I know we have a, a couple uh, big Yakuza fans here. Uh, well, and yeah, well. <laughs> one of the uh, the uh, the main features of of the Yakuza games is the. Uh, the gritty melodramatic uh, tone mixed with uh, the goofy off the wall uh, sub stories. Um, I think the Yakuza series owes a little bit to Metal Gear Solid uh, for that as well. Uh, the uh, I think Yakuza probably does a better job of compartmentalizing those two different, <laughs> those two divergent tones. Uh, Hideo Kojima. Trying to imagine Snake the, going uh, to a hostess club. Yeah, uh, Hideo Kojima, the uh, the creator of the the Metal Gear games, uh, liked to mix those tones a little bit more, and it, it got a little. It gets a little strange sometimes. Uh, the the man is a fan of his urine jokes. <laughs> Unlike Yakuza, sure... which which never gets strange ever. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's a character no, that wests themselves in every single Metal Gear Solid game. So yeah, uh, I don't think urine plays a part in any and any Yakuza game ever. Not in any side quests, right, Mike? <laughs> nope, never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the. Uh, 
probably the, the, the most quirkiness is seen in, in the bosses in, in Metal Gear Solid. For for one thing, in, in the first game, every every boss is named like a thing and then an animal. So you got like so you got Vulcan Raven, you got Revolver Ocelot, uh Sniper Wolf, and uh Psycho Mantis. Okay, qu- quick aside. Quick aside, listener, you're probably thinking of Mega Man X right now, and that's totally <laughs> fair. But I think both Mega Man X and Com- and uh, Metal Gear Solid get that from Common Rider, which because that was a, a mm-hmm. which is a, a superhero show from the '70s, uh, because a lot of monsters in Common Rider were set up like that. And Kojima has even like tweeted commentary tracks for old Common Rider episodes. So I'm I'm, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that's the inspiration there. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Abe. Please continue. <laughs> Uh, but there were, you know, there were a couple of things, especially about like the, the Psycho Mantis battle that, um, that, that really stuck in my mind. Uh, this series has like probably all of my favorite boss fights in video games. <laughs> um, but, uh, there was a, there was a few fun conventions in the, uh, in the, the Psycho Mantis fight. Uh, as you can kind of guess from the, from his name, um, he is a, a psychic. He does the ESP and mind reading and, and, uh, you know, telekinesis and all that. Uh, so because he can read your mind, you have to, uh, you can't defeat him in conventional ways. You you can't, you know, if you, if you aim your gun at him, you can't hit him. Uh, so you had to switch your controller to the second port and then he can't read your mind, which I thought was the creative use of the, uh, the PS one. Kojima just loves finding new ways to mess with players. Yeah. Uh, in with every with every game he makes, um, it, also in Metal Gear Solid One, like I hope you got that game in the original box because at one point in the game when you need to call someone, oh, yeah. the uh, there's no way to find their calls their call number on your radio unless you look at the back of the box and see her name with her call number on one of the images at the back of the box. Yeah. N- nowadays, if you if you don't have that box, I mean the internet's got your back, but still that that was just unthinkably weird for the time. And my, my favorite part of the psycho mantis boss fight is, uh, if you have Konami games on your memory card, that's in the first, uh, controller port, he'll comment on it. Like, I, I think the, yeah. the most famous one is he'll say, you like Castlevania, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I, I should mention here, I actively dislike stealth games in general. Whenever there's a stealth mission in a game that's mostly not about stealth, is my least favorite part of the game. That's true uh, from I mean, every, yeah. yeah, that's true from from yeah. uh, from your from your Zeldas to your Infamouses to to what have you. So I have uh, I have played through most of Metal Gear Solid One. I uh, I don't remember why I stopped playing it. I, I I ended up watching videos of the of parts of the game I didn't play, and I've played a tiny bit of Metal Gear Solid Two. But otherwise, I've decided I don't want to play any Hideo Ko- Kojima games because the guy is just I feel like his head is way too far up his own ass. <laughs> uh, and 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 getting as far as I did in Metal Gear Solid was a struggle because I really have a problem dealing with stealth games. I, th- I th- there's a stealth segment in uh, uh, Final Fantasy VII Crisis Core. That's not even that hard. It's it's probably ten or fifteen minutes. But I just got so frustrated at it. I I just sort of stopped and started a, a YouTube walkthrough of that stealth segment just to get through it. So be, because of stealth reasons, and not really because of writing reasons, even though again I, I don't always love Metal Gear Solid writing. Well, those um, games are so I, convoluted. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I have. Yeah, no, oh, I, oh, I don't have. I don't have problems with convoluted stories. I just just go back to our brief discussion on Yakuza a minute ago. But uh, I, I just haven't really gotten into Metal Gear Solid, despite playing more than half of the fir- of the first PlayStation One, be- because of stupid, stubborn reasons. But and, and also I don't like stealth. But I, I I know I feel like I know most of the story of the entire series, even going down to like your Metal Gear Acids and Revengeances, just because I've heard them talked about so much. Uh, so I, I have an appreciation from afar of the series, but I cannot, I cannot call myself a Metal Gear Solid player or fan. See, I, I love stealth. I love stealth. Stealth is fun for me. Um, and I really like the first title of the game of the series. I, I never bought it though. I only, I rented it for like, I think two or three weekends in a row. I don't think I've ever beaten the game, but I enjoyed it a great deal. But then I never got a PlayStation two, especially when the PlayStation two came out and, not a PlayStation 3 either. So I sort of missed where the series evolved to, and I've just never gotten back on there. But I've heard some excellent things about, well, stealth, for example, uh, and using balloons to capture your enemies and send them to 
to uh, non-lethally get rid of them. Uh, and that appeals to me. Yeah, and that appeals to me. So this is a series that I feel like I could possibly get, get into, uh, but there is a, like you were talking about a second ago, there's a lot of story in the way of getting, uh, making my way through it. So I don't know. this. I don't know if this is a game I will ever fully get into or not, but I do appreciate where it came from originally. And I mean, the Nintendo Metal Gear you know, for the NES is, is a pretty amazing game for that system, especially for the time. Well, there is a lot of story, but um, the one thing about, you know, I was thinking about this and, and the one thing about these games, I think, you know, if you play the first one, you don't necessarily have to play the rest of them in order. Um, I think you pretty much get at least, you know, I mean, since it is a very convoluted story, you, you kind of need a little bit of a basis for, you know, for a feel as to what's going on and why things are significant in the other games. But I think you could, you know, the, in terms of like the timeline, they, they jump around all over the place from the 70s to the 2010s. So I think you probably could, you know, if you play the first game, probably just jump to whichever other one and, and probably get a good idea of what's going on. Again, I know a lot of story about these games without having played all of them. I, I know that uh, Metal Gear Solid 3 takes place in the 70s, and Metal Gear Solid 1, 2, and 3 have different main characters for each of them. Yeah. And they're and, uh, uh, avoiding some spoilers here it, with, a, with you know, sort of different uh, hitting different parts of the Metal Gear universe in each of their uh, stories. Um, but, but again, Metal Gear Solid 4 is sort of a, like a, a, a Snake's final chapter kind of game. Metal Gear Solid Five adds a bunch of open world elements and hits a different a different era in the Metal Gear Solid timeline that hadn't really been uh, approached yet. Isn't Metal Gear Solid Three like a prequel to Metal Gear for the NES? Yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah, it, it, so like it, there's there's a lot of interconnected story stuff in these games and a lot of references, but in a way that you don't have to play all of them in order, but it's more rewarding if you the, the more you play them. But may, maybe don't make Metal Gear Solid Four your first one. It's sort of, it's sort of my, it's sort of the vibe I get. Yeah, and the second one is a little bit skippable in terms of the story. <laughs> ah, yeah, Snake's Revenge. That yeah. that uh, un- unassailable classic. <laughs> <laughs> um, if they, if Konami adds, I don't think they did, but if they add, um, I think it was, didn't didn't. One, two, and three have a collection. Yeah. It's delisted okay, on the all Xbox right, look, If you're interested in Konami it. adding something, it's, yeah. it's, stop hoping. It's not, yeah. <laughs> if they add it back, or if I can find my PlayStation 3, I will go and play the Metal Gear Solid yeah. series. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, sadly, I was looking at it, and I think the only way to play uh, Metal Gear Solid 1 on any platform is through GOG. Which, And if you don't want to give CD oh, yeah. Projekt Red Weird. money, then... <laughs> uh you're you're out of luck i guess <laughs> so, yeah tracking down that series is going to be my worst enemy because it's a series that i've always wanted to try but getting a hold of the games is quite hard if it's not right five <laughs> yeah it is kind of sad that uh, so, uh konami doesn't really seem to have a, a whole lot of interest in uh in yeah, those. so it is. It is a series that I want to play. It's just a series that I can't yeah. get my hands on, yeah. unfortunately. <laughs> well, if you wait a little while, I'm sure they'll release some NFTs of like screenshots yeah. of the game. That'd be great. <laughs> oh, good. Uh, yeah, I've heard rumors of that for their uh, because it's the Metal Gear Solid's 35th anniversary this year. Yeah, no, that's K- that's how you want to celebrate it with NFTs. Yeah, right. Yeah, you know. K- Konami's not. Re- I, I've mentioned this in other podcasts, so I'm sorry, but uh, Konami's not really in the business of making new games anymore. But they're definitely willing to make collections of their older games that are packaged decently. I think because uh, Konami's other businesses, like uh, health clubs and gyms, have been affected badly by the pandemic, while their video game downloads have been perhaps doing as well as ever. So I, I think it's maybe they would need some cooperation with Kojima, with Kojima that would never happen. But I think Konami releasing some Metal Gear digitally is possible. But but don't look for. A, a great new Metal Gear game coming soon. Yeah, that's not going to happen. But I, I don't remember the exact circumstance, and I'm not going to like dig up an article about it right now. But there were some uh, Xbox 3... It was like a collection on Xbox 360 that was available on Xbox One and series consoles and back when Pat that for whatever reason Konami delisted. 
I don't remember why or if they said why, but that was really the only way that I was going to be able to get a hold of those games reliably. And you can't. <laughs> so I don't know. Wah, wah. I hope that they release the games on modern consoles in one way or another. I mean, five is not a, a terrible starting point. Um, it's uh, it's kind of a different flavor than the uh, than the other games. Um, uh, the uh, first four were very heavily focused on the story, and for the fifth game, it's a little bit more sparse. And the the real focus is on you know really wide open uh, stealth uh, gameplay and you know playing in the uh, the sandbox of uh, of a uh, well, it's, I think it's Afghanistan. <laughs> um, I didn't get into the fifth one as much, um, mostly because uh, it just felt so different from the, the first four games. It, it seems like a great game, but, you know, kind of needed to come into it with a different perspective, I guess. It definitely leans more into that open world yeah. style of game, it seemed like. I think I think five still has possibly one of the best sandboxes, just in terms of the sheer like options available to you to tackle like any sort of any sort of enemy outpost in liter- in really any fashion you like. You can, you know, plan the physics ahead and like preemptively plant mines so that you can predict how the enemies are going to react to you, I don't know, blowing up um, blowing up like a balloon in front of them so they like stumble backwards into the mine that you set up earlier. And there's like a whole bunch of crazy montages on YouTube that really, I feel, demonstrate just how... Um, well implemented the systems are in MGS5. Yeah, and then the very concept of basically sort of capturing an enemy unit and airlifting them back to your base only for them to join you for future missions is one of those things that doesn't really make sense until you do it and then it suddenly becomes incredibly fun, kind of like kind of like explaining how Mario possesses things in Mario Odyssey. It's like I don't really get it, but once you once you try it, you totally get it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, uh, no, <laughs> on on paper that sounds very immersion. <laughs> no, you don't get it, but it is fun. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those. Yeah. It's one of those quirks. <laughs> uh, one of those Kojima quirks. Yeah, God, Kojima quirks from his mm. thoughts on the Cold War to his, his open horniness in every single game, going all the way back to police to police knots and Snatcher. Uh, we, we don't. I think maybe I'm more interested in playing Snatcher than I'm I am. I'm not even sure you can say that on a podcast. And uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, the subject yeah. matter might not uh, might not want modernize too well, but yeah. But uh, I, I think we've uh, exhausted most of our Metal Gear Solid discussions, especially since we're uh, less than halfway through and knocking on the door of an hour. Uh, so, Stephen, let's go on to your topic for round one. It's a it's a smaller game, but it's a game that has seen like um, one big. Uh, refresh and has been released on pretty much every uh, major console. How dare you call um, Tetris a smaller game, you monster? It's an indie title. Indie smaller title. Tetris Effect is a smaller <laughs> game. I'm detecting Tetris slander, and, and if you don't change your tone yet, man, I'm ending the podcast <laughs> I, this moment. I will turn this podcast around. So I, I really enjoy um, Tetris Effect. I think, you know, to, to, other panelists this may it's i think the only version of tetris that i have um really gotten into and have always wanted to come back to um i've played almost every version of this game i have not played the switch version because i don't need to double dip and i got uh one or two of the other versions for free um i recently played so what what tetris effect is is it is basically modern tetris playstyle with the backdrop and music of um, like similar inspirations from, I think, uh, Tetsuya Mizuguchi worked on Luminous and Res Infinite. And it brings that philosophy into Tetris to great effect with gorgeous uh, backgrounds and particle effects. And it really um, evokes the feeling of just getting into the zone even though there's a quote unquote zone mechanic in the game, but I just like playing it so much because it's very vibrant and I feel like I've done better at Tetris than I have playing other versions of the game that are more simple and not um, heavy on the effects and music. Um, I've recently gotten to the VR version of the game 
and I really enjoyed a lot. I think um, if VR was easier for me to adapt to, I'd probably be playing that a lot more. Um, but I, I just really enjoy Tetris Effect. I want to go back and play Mizuguchi's other games at some point, um, being Res and Luminous. Um, I think I tried Luminous once or twice, um, but didn't get too far into it since it's a very unique type of puzzle game. But um, I enjoy Tetris Effect quite a lot. I don't know if you guys have played it before. I have. I, I have also. Um, I've played many a Tetris game, and Tetris has had an unusual resurgence recently with uh, Tetris 99 on Switch as a sort of a, mul- a wacky, crazy multiplayer version of Tetris, and Tetris Effect, which has, you know, a incomparable video and audio presentation for what Tetris is. And and Mizuguchi with, uh, I mean, Rez all the way back in the Dreamcast and Luminous all the way back in the PSP were p- puzzle games that had some Tetris DNA in there, but r- but really take the sights and sounds of what a puzzle game is to a to a, psych- a level of psychedelia that uh that feel really special. I love both of those games, especially Luminous. And if and if you're Luminous curious, then the Luminous remastered for the Switch is brilliant because it has I think every stage from Luminous 1 and 2 in it. Uh with with like the exception of one a couple licensed songs. So it's th- that's a hell of a package. But Tetris Effect um a- as a really special cool evolution of Tetris <clears throat> is 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 just fantastic i have not played it in vr but i have played it on ps4 a non-trivial amount and it uh, it comes very <laughs> recommended uh and spreading this out a little bit the, the the way that um companies have been modernizing their most classic puzzle games when it's pulled off well it is almost the most exciting thing they could possibly do uh I mean, I'm I'm a big fan of Tales of Zillia and and Soul Calibur Six, but the coolest thing Nam- Namco has done in 20 years is uh, are the updates they've made to um uh, to Pac-Man with the the, the Championship Edition games of Pac-Man. So, like, basically taking Tetris and making it feel new and special is very very powerful for me. Who's Tetris was uh, the first video game I ever owned on the on the Game Boy way way back in the day. So, uh, like a, a, a version of Tetris that's just beautiful and acclaimed was really exciting to me. And uh, Mizuguchi is exactly the right person to handle it. And uh, and I I haven't played it. I haven't played Res Infinite. I've only played a re- old Res. But uh, Luminous Remastered is a is a really really good title to pick up. Um, I don't. I honestly haven't researched um, the rights uh, for this game because. I'm actually surprised that um, Tetris, a Tetris Effect game came out outside of Sega and Electronic Arts, because from what I remember, those two companies um, share the licensing. So I'm very happy that we got a very uh, unique version of um, modern Tetris outside of those two companies. Who owns Tetris is a very weird question. Uh, and uh, like it, it was, it was developed in the Soviet Union in the in in the middle '80s, and a lot of different companies have had uh, have had different versions of Tetris over the years. My favorite version of Tetris before Tetris Effect is actually Tetris DS, which I think was so bu- good. Yeah, which I think was built in studio by Nintendo. So I, I don't think Sega or EA necessarily owns the uh, owns the rights to it. And, and again, Nintendo owned Tetris for a while, but uh, but it, I, I think it's owned by like EA for mobile versions and a, a a special original Tetris company for non-mobile versions, and they license it out to all kinds of people. I I, I think is how it happens, but I, I could be wrong about that because again, who owns Tetris and who's allowed to make Tetris games like has changed with every decade. I'm just glad that Tetris Effect got made because it owns. Me too. Cause, well, I, I just said that off the top of my head because I know that EA makes uh, mobile versions of Tetris games, like you said, and then uh, Sega made the Puyo Puyo Tetris uh, games. So those are what popped into my head most uh, for games that have, you know, came out recently other than Tetris Effect. 
that used uh, the Tetris IP? Uh I, I I mean, there's a few documentaries about this on YouTube of uh, just how Tetris, you know, who owns it and that kind of thing. Uh, according to Wiki, the Tetris company owns uh, the exclusive right. Okay, so it's uh, the exclusive licensee of Tetris Holdings LLC that owns the Tetris rights worldwide, but it does license the Tetris brand now to third parties. So uh, yeah, we all own Tetris. <laughs> have, yeah. have the rest of you played Tetris Effect I've, before? I own it for uh, Switch. It might be one of my favorite versions of Tetris. Uh, like Mike, when you said Tetris DS, like I, I had it for Game Boy as well, um, and I played the hell out of that. I actually broke my first DS because I was playing too much Tetris, and I broke the right uh, shoulder button. Um, it just, it just, it just wore off. It just broke, uh, so I had to buy another DS and. Uh, oh. That, that version of the game is amazing, uh, especially if you love Nintendo history. Don't worry. I played so much Monster Hunter on a PSP. I am on my third broken PSP now. So <laughs> I, 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 understand a, me. I understand a thing or two about wearing out handhelds. <laughs> yep. But, um, te- <laughs> you mentioned playing Tetris Effect on Switch. I really wish I had an OLED because if I did, then I would buy the I Switch. I don't have an OLED. I just have my my big screen TV. Uh, it I, I, I have my jaw dropping. Uh, good. I have Tetris effect on PS five. It's the PS four version of it on PS five, but yeah, yeah. I had no idea that what I wanted was to play Tetris while someone flashed a strobe light in my eyes. No, <laughs> no but mm. playing it on a high handheld on a high quality screen, like the OLED switch seems ideal. Uh, for me, Tetris is the closest I come to meditation. I don't like meditating. I've done it before. I did it in theater school. I hate it. Um, I do a lot of yoga, but that's for fitness, not for clearing my head. But when I play Tetris, uh, it's, it's really like, it's like a, it clears my head instantly. I just, I can shut off all other thought processes and just, and just play. Um, so when I downloaded Tetris effect connected, uh, I didn't know what to expect. And I found that it was a tremendously meditative experience. The music is gorgeous. Uh, the backgrounds, the art of it all is stunning, there are some levels that drive me absolutely crazy. Any level that doesn't actually use uh, solid squares for the blocks really screws with my head for some reason. Like the Da Vinci level with the like where the the pieces are like little windmills, even though they are still in the same uh, arrangements. For some reason, my eyes see that and it it just short circuits my brain, and I have so much trouble figuring out patterns. Um, I think it's amazing. It, it really hits a, a, a real sweet spot for Tetris for me, uh, where like Tetris 99 is amazing, uh, but it's a very different experience. That's not meditative. That is, that's the closest thing I've come to a street fight. That's stressful. <laughs> that, 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 that's an assault. That's maybe, I mean, going back to Capcom fighters, I think Tetris 99 yeah. is a fighting game while Tetris effect is a, is a meditative, like floaty mm-hmm. game, Close, maybe closer to journey than Tetris 99. Yeah, I don't think I've ever become. I'm I'm never as feral as I am when I'm down to the last two people playing Tetris 99. Um, that's that's when I just I get very very focused and like I could kill a man right now, but with Tetris <laughs> blocks. <laughs> you know, rolling it back a little bit before the Tetris company formed, uh, Tetris was owned by Nintendo for a while, and uh, don't be fooled, Tetris Attack is not a Tetris game. <laughs> <laughs> Tetris Attack for the Super Nintendo is a Nintendo version of Puyo Puyo, which didn't which didn't have an officially named Puyo Puyo game worldwide for many years later. Uh, Pokemon Puzzle League is also a Puyo Puyo game, but Tetris Attack is the Super Mario Yoshi's Island version of Puyo Puyo for the Super Nintendo. Not a Tetris game. Let's separate that away from Tetris Effect. Uh, please continue. <laughs> Okay, uh, you know, maybe, maybe if, well, I'm, if I'm talking about Puyo Puyo, maybe it's time to move on to the next topic. <laughs> uh, let's move on to round two, and let's try to make round two a little bit shorter because we're already over an hour. Uh, we were just talking about how Tetris Effect is a very meditative game. When I want to turn off my brain a little bit and uh, do something meditative, you know, you know that's a little unfair because I'm about to talk about a genre that is somewhat cerebral, but I treat it as meditative because I never, I never challenge hunt or uh or or play these on the hardest difficulty um customizable card games and deck building games but they're oh. digital versions okay. are <laughs> something i've gotten more and more into over the over the years uh I, I played magic the gathering as a kid 
uh and and you know i i stopped playing around when the around when the wrath cycle ended for anyone that is up to date on the magic the gathering stuff which i am not and i and i have done things like uh like 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 draft tournaments at uh, at conventions before and then had some fun with magic but i i i have got had the most fun with card games i've ever had recently because things that i my least favorite things about card games like cleanup and scoring and counting very complicated rounds are already are automatically taken care of in these games with digital versions. So I have digital versions of, uh, let's say, three or four Magic Duels of the Planeswalker games and Slay the Spire and Monster Train and Ascension and at least two branded deck builder games uh, for, for either mobile, mobile or PC. And once I have a grasp of the rules of one of these and all of the cards, oh, and Sentinels of the Multiverse, that one might, might be my overall favorite, even though that's more of a CCG and not a deck builder. Uh, basically, taking everything that I love about these old deck builders, doing the scoring automatically for me, and having me not buy goddamn booster packs and waste all of my allowance <laughs> on them every week, and oh, instead yeah. <laughs> either having it as an all-in-one package or an all-in-one package and then a couple DLCs to add a bunch of more cards, that pricing structure as well as them being on sale on steam all the time has made it has has made me like when i want to just play a, a video game and not think about story and not focus on on intense action i will just play a round of monster train or sentinels that'll take me between 15 and 30 minutes and just have a great time and, and because i already know the cards i've played them long enough i can i can just figure out or or a you know or a run of slay the spire whether it's just individually contained rounds that don't connect or they add a roguelike element to it, like Monster Trainer Slay the Spire. It's just playing card games is a format I love and the digital versions of those cut out some of the BS that I don't love. That And and as a result, I have put an irresponsible amount of time into digital versions <laughs> of, of, real, of real life uh, CCGs and DBGs. And uh, so it's a genre that I, I I can't call myself an expert or a fiend of, but like I, I play these the way my dad plays solitaire, and it's be, it's something I've settled into over the years. Oh yeah. Um, before you mentioned your disdain for for uh, CCGs, um, I was going to ask you if you've ever uh, tried out Teppen. Oh, Teppen the the, 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 the Capcom one. Yeah, I yeah. I, uh, I played the I played a little bit of uh, of Teppen when it launched, but then it just has too many elements of Gacha that I don't want. Yeah, and I, something that you don't have to worry about in the um, in the games that you were talking about was um, the standard rotation of Teppen is kind of unforgiving. Um, in that, I think it has a rotation of six packs at once. So getting back into the game is um, rather hard, but I do understand the appeal of just um, online versions of um, card games where you have most, if not all, of the library already to play around. Oh yeah, with. like a, a game like you know Ascension or Sentinels, where here's uh, ten dollars for the main game, and then a couple expansions at four dollars each. I, I I I'm not I'm not pressured to buy uh, to buy gacha packs. Or a ton of expansions, mm-hmm. even though even though both of those two games have a lot of expansions, like, like the self-contained nature of it is part of why I still play Duels of the Planeswalkers 2014, and I'm not interested in Magic: The Gathering Arena, which sounds insane, <laughs> ju- justifiably insane, but is sort of just goes into my mindset of what I want to get out of these. But to be her- <laughs> to be fair, I hear that uh, Magic the Gathering Arena's economy is really bad. I'm not shocked. I'm not surprised. I mean, so. the economy was really bad when I was buying uh, like like those, those uh, Wrath Cycle, uh, Tempest, and Stronghold packs in 1998. So I, 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 I get it, and I don't want to do that again. So I've, I've also gotten um, really into those style of card games, um, but I haven't really considered the angle of the um, buy it once and you have all the library type of games to play against AI. Um, I, I play some I, of it online, but pro- probably 80% of the time on, is against AI. Cause, yeah. Because I, again, I, I do this to, to relax and not, and not to win. It's definitely something I want to try at some point. Yeah, it does sound very interesting because um, I play 
way too much of like trade of um, CCGs online, such as um, on Steam. I play Shadowverse a lot, which is yeah, it's it's basically like anime Hearthstone in many ways. Yeah, I, I remember when that was being advertised quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> And, and and Hearthstone again is it, it's it's I, I did try Hearthstone but I bounced off it pretty fast because again it's not what I'm looking to get out of yeah. the CCG. But yeah, I do. I definitely do agree uh, with like the how how uh, meditative it can feel because it's not like a. I mean, yeah, for me, the like the more mechanically challenging a game is, the more I have to be like very actively playing the game and very involved and in many ways it is tiring even after just like an hour or two but with like um with ccgs for me at least um it is very relaxing you just oh you know you just like for me it just plays in the background almost oh well well, it's my turn um well yeah i guess i'll play this card now and then it's just okay i'll just wait for the opponent to do their thing and then i can go back to doing my thing in the meantime so it is um yeah, a very relaxing experience for me as well. I have to exactly say. right. Yeah, e- either to relax or or to do while you're watching something or listening to a podcast. I think it's, it's that's the ideal format. I remember a uh, actually a Magic the Gathering game from the 1997. It looked like um, from Microprose, where it was actually like an RPG where you you build up a deck and then you had to wander around this. Uh, Whatever the world was called, what's I, I think I think what's I, the world I, I played, called? Well, um, the, the, the thing is, there's there's plane planeswalkers that travel between different worlds. Uh, so it, it was probably oh, set in yeah. one in one of those. And I I, yeah, yeah. I either played that or watched a friend play because it, it sounds it very was, familiar. It was hard as hell though. <laughs> that was not relaxing. <laughs> it, was not, it wasn't very good really, but it it got me my Magic the Gathering fix when when I it when. Uh, my friends who played it weren't around. I I, uh, the one that I tried from around there, I, I th- it, it almost felt like an adventure game, but I, I don't remember what it was called. I'd, I'd, I'd have to Google it, but I, I, I've played games like that, but if, a self-contained Magic the Gathering experience, um, that sort of, uh, that's not Arena. Go onto Steam and pick up one of the uh, Duels of the Planeswalkers games for 10 bucks or so. It's a... Uh, it, it it will it will definitely be about magic cards from around that time for better or for worse but uh th- that's that's my magic the gathering experience uh most recently but uh now this is definitely not a magic the gathering podcast because i'm sure like from what little i know about pl- magic the gathering players i'm sure there are a million podcasts about it so we we don't we don't need to uh we don't need to we don't need to dip our toes into that market but um <laughs> yeah. but one game that's a an action game, a first person game with a lot of RPG elements. That if we, uh, Jono, if we argued hard enough, hard enough, we could probably talk uh, Mike and Salvato into covering this. Is Bioshock and Dom? I would love hmm. for you to tell us all about Bioshock. Of course. Um, so Bioshock One came out two thousand six. I want to say around that yeah, time. I, I think it was. I think it was oh seven, but yep. around that time. Yeah, it was like 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 early uh, three hundred and sixty PS three. Yeah, and. Um, it was just mind blowing. Of course, at the time, the whole are we are we allowed to spoil the game here? <laughs> the, I mean, if we say spoilers, I mean, and don't it's go, also don't go uh, don't go into the very end. We can talk about big uh, daddies and little sisters, but mm-hmm. please, but uh, would you kindly not spoil the end game? Okay. Um. Well, it has by far probably one of the most um I think like one of the most incredible twists in the narrative. Not only once, but I think twice um, as you play through the game. And um, yeah, Rapture, Bioshock was just, I feel just a step up in terms of world building and environmental storytelling and just the gameplay system as well. The whole um, fooling, toying around with plasmids. And one thing I also really appreciated, um, especially in the after replaying the first ones more recently after playing uh, Bioshock 1 and 2, is how um, everything in the game ties back to the background or to, to the backstory. And there's no, I, there's really no like superfluous element in the story and everything has a purpose. And um, I feel like one of the shortcomings of Bioshock 1 was um, I feel it didn't have quite as good of a, like a personal story. It had a very good 
like big overarching plot throughout the story, but I didn't really feel much for the main character or anything like that. And I feel Bioshock 2 is a game that really remedies this in a lot of ways. Um, Bioshock 2 does get a lot of flack, I feel, quite unfairly so, because it is, you know, like, oh, it's just a retread of Rapture. Oh, it's not really that exciting. But Bioshock 2, you get to play as big daddies, as as the first big daddy, who are like, uh, who are, uh, in Bioshock 1, there were boss enemies you encountered. And for uh, just as a, it's, it's a, I feel, I feel like it was a fresh enough take for a sequel and Bioshock 2 really improves upon, I feel the personal story that could, that could be told within Rapture. And personally, I do enjoy Bioshock 2 more than one, <laughs> which might be a bit oh, of a, might be a bit of a hot take, but I feel, yeah, so Bioshock hot. 2. Dropping that, oof, too hot. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, I just feel Bioshock 2, when I played it, I just had, um, I knew about Rapture, I had the backstory, I know what it's about, and Bioshock 2 just added that nice personal personal edge to the story that I enjoyed a lot more, with, especially with its very varied endings, I feel it had a better um, morality system in place than Bioshock 1, which was very, very kind of very in your face, and a little bit too... On the nose, I would say, and and of course we have Infinite, which personally, um, I'm not a big fan of, which also might be a bit of a hot take, but so, so hot. I found Infinite, it. <laughs> I found Infinite to be just a bit, um, I mean, of course Infinite was met with huge critical acclaim when it was released in 2013, but I just felt a lot of Infinite didn't didn't feel quite as cohesive as Rapture did. Like the vigors were kind of not really explained properly. They were just kind of there because it's a Bioshock game and you get to do cool fancy abilities like taking taking um, control over people's minds and like shooting electricity out of your hands. And they implemented like a weapon system limit. Like you can only carry two weapons at a time, but they have a whole bunch of weapons that they kind of want you to experiment with, but it, I felt like there were a lot of conflicting design decisions in Bioshock, both in terms of gameplay and story, or in Bioshock Infinite in terms of gameplay and story that I didn't quite vibe with. So it's still a good game. I'd still play it, but it's not my favorite of the series, definitely. Okay, okay. I I have a lot of thoughts here. I'm, I'm gonna try to I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to avoid over soliloquizing about this. But um, Bioshock is not my kind of game. I don't play very many first person shooting games at all. But the, the grand exceptions to those rules are uh, Far Cry Three, which I adore, the Mass Effect series, which I adore, and Bioshock One, which was basically universally acclaimed when it came out. And I played it a year or two later and in, uh, let, let's say, 09 or 2010, because that, that's I, I didn't get a PS3 until 09, and that's definitely why I played it. And I loved it. It is this game that is that is very, very bleak, but is definitely about, um, about uh, giving players a lot of gameplay decision power. Like, depending on your combination of plasmids and how much you've explored and what you've done so far in the game, there are in, a ton of ways to approach any enemy or any boss fight. And because you're in this underwater bunker that was built as an Anne Rind utopia that, and then completely failed and fell into disrepair and, uh, and cannibalism and, and all kinds of, uh, of nasty nonsense. It's a, it, it's this r really cool, scary setting, but you're right. The, the, the player character is a bit detached from rapture and the main character of Bioshock one, I would say is rapture, the, the city yep, and the learning definitely. about, yeah, yeah. Learning about the setting and the politics of, of the people leading it and why it fell and who you're dealing with. It's a, it, it was maybe the biggest example of those. Uh, you can almost make fun of them now, but like the uh, games that where their narrative was delivered to you by finding tapes or, uh, or, or audio diaries, like that became a really, really a weird recurring trope of games in the two thousands. And, and the, the South park RPG even made fun of that a lot in in uh in that game but but like your your bioshocks and your dead spaces and whatnot they they all they all did that and bioshock was may, maybe the biggest culprit but in that kind of storytelling they give you a lot of 
really interesting world building. And I maintain, and again, I'm not an expert on first person uh, shooters or first person RPGs, but f- uh, Fort Frolic, the area where Xander Cohen is sort of mm-hmm. the main is sort of the main head honcho, yeah. is one of the best levels of the tw- of the 2000s. That th- that part around the middle of the game is peak Bioshock to me because mm-hmm. even though most of the decision making in Bioshock is do you kill them or do you not kill them? Um, like like uh, everything that you see in Fort Frolic is scary and twisted, and Xander Cohen is a completely off the wall character. Uh, and the, the, both the, the setting and the quest design is just really good in that level. Uh, uh, like while a lot of the optional stuff in Bioshock is do, how do you avoid the big daddy or how do you kill the big daddy and or and do you save the little sister for less rewards or do you kill the little sister for more rewards? It's it's a little bit binary and the decision making isn't that interesting, but the gameplay variety is incredible in Bioshock One mm-hmm. and Bioshock Two. Mostly we're using the setting. But have being more character driven is really interesting. I've also heard the Bioshock Two DLC is great, but I, oh, yeah. I haven't played. I haven't played it, so I don't know that. And and Bioshock Infinite getting an incredibly positive critical reception at the time, and then a uh, a popular reception that started out mostly positive and then got worse and worse over the years because of the problematic parts of its storytelling. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and it's very very awkward tie-ins to old Bioshock. Bioshock Infinite was very celebrated at first, and now people will call it maybe the worst of the trilogy, depending on who you ask. It's 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 really interesting looking at the lifetime of Bioshock from 2007 to 2013 and beyond. But I think that again, the only one I, I've only played the first few hours of, of Infinite, and I have not touched Bioshock Two. Mm-hmm. But Bioshock One is wonderful, and I think that anyone that can get into this type kind of game absolutely should try it. I think it's, I think Bioshock one is foundational to a lot of what in every genre, including RPGs uh, that we play today. Like you said, the audio diary uh, systems, environmental storytelling, like it was unparalleled at the time and it still uh, shines today. Actually, I think that I think game makers toolkit, one of his earliest videos was about Fort Frolic, uh, which is an amazing level of a video game. Uh, I love Bioshock. I think it's a great game. I like Bioshock too. It didn't stick with me as much. I don't know. I, I found the philosophical questions raised by the antagonist in that game weren't quite as interesting as the ones that were raised in Bioshock uh, 1, but it was a very good game and it played very well. I am one of those people who really actually enjoys uh, Bioshock Infinite. I am a sucker for parallel universes, alternate realities. Um, the way that game explores that uh, breaks down, it becomes very meta around the end of it without you know, explaining uh, without any spoilers. Uh, And I really, really enjoy that. I had a lot of fun with Bioshock Infinite. I think the big thing for me is what Bioshock Infinite could have been. If you watched some of like the E3 trailers and things like that, about what was promised and what they were working towards. uh, And eventually they needed to scale back because I guess time limits and restrictions on what video games could do in that period. uh, It feels a bit like a tragedy because like this could have been, it's hard to describe what this game could have been. If you watch the trailers, you'll understand. Um, as it is, it feels a little bit like a shadow of that, but mm-hmm. it's still a shadow that I enjoy. And I think that Elizabeth is one of the uh, best supporting characters in a video game ever made. I love her. I think she is extraordinarily well acted. Um, I think her her journey, her character uh, journey is uh, touching and heartbreaking and logical. And... Uh, where she ends up at the very end of that game and at the end of the DLC is another question uh, is it, it's painful in a lot of ways. And I really like that character. So I think if you're going to be talk, coming at it from a character point of view, uh, I think the strongest character in all of the games is Elizabeth. Uh, so I'm not a horror game type of player. You know, I, I didn't find um, the prospect of Alan Wake all that appealing. But for whatever reason, when I was playing Bioshock 1, I really enjoyed the atmospheric horror nature of it. Uh, it was one, It's one of the only horror-esque games that I actually finished and really enjoyed it for that matter. Uh, I have not played 2, and I did beat Infinite, but I have not finished the DLC that they did, uh, which takes place um, before the events of the first game. 
Um, but I don't know, for some apparent reason, Bioshock one just has that very, uh, interesting place in my, uh, gaming library where it's a horror game that I finished. (laughs) I mean, I played a bit of the the first Bioshock, um, for whatever reason, uh, you know, I, I got part of the way through it and got busy with something else in life or whatever. And, um, I haven't, I haven't actually finished the first game, but. That's yeah. That's definitely a series that I want to try try again on, sometime. All right. Well, I, I think we've uh, each delivered our thoughts on Bioshock. I, I think that game's excellent. But let's talk about a different excellent first person game that came out in two thousand and seven. Uh, Jano, educate us on Portal. First off, two thousand and seven was a hell of a year. Um, yes, it was. You, you, you look, look at that list. There's there. It's full of bangers from your Mario galaxies to your portals to what have you. But uh, but yeah, let's let's stick to Portal. Yeah. So uh, Portal is a. It's not just an amazing game. I would argue it's one of the most. Uh, I would argue it might be one of the funniest games ever made. Uh, to this day, it's just pitch black hilarious. Um, it's a brilliant puzzle game, and it's a. It's a. I mean, there's a reason why. It might be one of the reasons why Steam uh, as a platform even exists now is because of, you know, the success of Portal and obviously Half-Life. Um, so Portal was originally going to be developed by uh, a bunch of kids just in, like, school. They developed a game called, I think it was, let me look at it, Narbacular Drop. Uh, they created this, the, the Portal system. But it was, this this game looked very uh, medieval and was kind of like, a, it was very grungy and medieval and uh, looked like it, it was almost hell. More of a- it was almost more of a tech demo or a proof of concept than a full game, but it 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 it, it is the Portal Zero that that led to Portal happening. Yeah, and then uh, they they showed it to Valve, and Valve's response was, "Yeah, we'll buy it, and we'll take all of you too." And then they put the entire team to work on creating Portal. Um, and originally, Portal used assets from Half Life because it was using the same engine. And eventually, it, it was revealed it takes place in the same world, but it's very standalone. And the first game is. I would argue one of the best experiences to this day uh, you can have playing a video game. Uh, it is a perfect little pearl of a game. It only takes a few hours to play. Um, it's hysterically funny. The character of GLaDOS, uh, who is the antagonist and your, I guess, your companion character who talks to you throughout, uh, is amazing. It ends with probably the biggest su- and like best surprises of any video game I've ever played. Uh, the ending of this game is legendary for a reason. Um, and it became, you know, it was very popular. And my, what was most amazing, it wasn't even a standalone game. It was released as a part of the Orange Box, uh, and the, which was, you know, included Half-Life. And I think Half-Life Episode 1 and Team Fortress 2? Or was it just Team Fortress 1? Uh, no, it was Team Fortress 2, Half-Life Episode 1 and 2, and Half-Life 2 and Portal. It was five games a full console release. I think it's the only place way to play uh, a, a, a Valve game on 360 or PS3, um, and and and, Val- and Valve has been all uh, PC ever since. But I, I re- that 2007 Orange Box is one of the most sp- special collections of video games ever. But uh, but please continue. Yeah, it's legendary. Um, so anyway, after after that success, they were looking at you know trying to come out with a Portal Two, and they were working with some different. Um, mechanics uh one of which is they they they've never really revealed it but eventually they realized uh we we're gonna stick with portal and uh, okay we're if we're gonna bring back glados we need to also bring back chell who is the main character um but they introduced a, a new a new delightful character named wheatley who has gone down in history as again one of the funniest uh characters in gaming um and Portal 2 was a massive expansion of Portal 1 which revisited even some of the earlier areas but introduced uh, introduced some new concepts, some very very smart puzzles, and uh, introduced many many people to uh, the work of J.K. Simmons, who, as many people know, is you know uh, J. Jonah Jameson, but is also I would, Cave Johnson. I would argue <laughs> equally iconic Cave Johnson here as it, it as, best character in the whole series. Cave Johnson. When life gives you lemons, don't make lemonade. <laughs> make life take the lemons back. Make life take the lemons back. Um, it's yeah. It's probably one of the best comedic monologues in all of video games. And come on, but before J. Jonah Jameson, he was on Law and Order in the '90s for like five years or something. Yeah, and he was a, on Oz as well. Yeah. Oh, oh God, he was terrifying in Oz. 
Yeah. Good lord. He's an astounding actor. I think anyone. I think everyone agrees with that. Um, yeah. He he won his Oscar for uh, for Whiplash many years later. But but uh, uh, but again, he absolutely slays it as Cave Johnson. Yeah. It's an amazing. And, performance. Oh, and, 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 and oh goodness, he was um he was in the Invincible cartoon last year. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, he was. He was uh, Omni Man. Um. Anyway, so yeah, this the you know Portal Two was amazing. But what was even more amazing is how they expanded it. They came out with the first co op. Uh, with a co-op mm-hmm. version of it, they released the uh, Perpetual Testing Initiative, which was uh, people could create their own levels. And they even created a Cave Johnson story to accompany it. Um, and there have been multiple uh, fan-based DLCs that have been released over the years, which, while not quite as good, uh, have uh, were, are very good. Like there's the... Uh, there's Aperture Tag, which involves it, it, it still uses portals, but you don't have a portal gun. You have a, a, a gun that paints the walls with various kinds of paint that you, you use for puzzle solving in this game. Uh, portal Stories, which takes place, it's a prequel to the game. Uh, a recent one, which is amazing, is Portal Reloaded, uh, which introduces a third portal, which allows you to travel through time um, in test chambers and which creates quite a few head scratchers. But yeah, I think these games are amazing. One of the biggest tragedies for me is when I played it, and for years after, I didn't have any friends who played video games. I was very like I, I went I went to theater school and I went to school with people who just didn't like video games for the most part. I have never found anyone that I can play the co op campaign with Portal Two in. I played that game to death, and I've never played the co op campaign. Um, and Amanda is insanely sick when she plays uh, first person shooters. Uh, she can't play them, so I can't play it with Amanda. Um, at some point, I will play it. I will find someone who has never played the perpetu- or has never played the co-op campaign and wants to play it. But until then, yeah, this is a brilliant game. I don't think anyone can argue with that. Um, even if they aren't a fan of puzzle games, it, there's still so many pieces of this that's just it just makes it one of the best video game experiences you can possibly have in my mind. Um, I, I adore Portal and Portal Two. I played them a little bit late. I, I didn't have a. I had laptops for uh, university in the in the late two thousands, but I didn't have a PC that could play good video games until uh, late twenty eleven, early twenty twelve, when I built the machine that I am using right now to p- record this podcast. And uh, I, I had, you know, I already had a Steam account to play some older things on my laptop, but. When I uh, loaded up my Steam account on my new PC for the first time, one of the first things I got was a Portal 1 and 2 uh, collection. I think it was at a summer sale or maybe the holiday sale in 2012. I played them back to back and they were one of the first games I played on my, on my new PC when I was exploring good PC gaming for the first time in my life. Because you know, until this, then I was, I was still playing starcraft one in 2010 on an old laptop that was that was on its last legs but it, playing them back to back was so special to me and uh i i think portal 2 is one of the great video game sequels it expands the world and expands the gameplay and and uh adds to, and it tells a great story without feeling like it loses control of its of its narrative and it's fun throughout. It doesn't it doesn't stay around too long and or ever get boring. And then it has all this cool multiplayer stuff that I didn't I didn't play the multiplayer with friends on PC, but one of my friends that had Portal 2 on his 360, um, I, I played it with him uh oh, I don't know. I, I think I think sometime after I finished the single player story on my own. And and the the co-op is as good or better than the gameplay of the main story. It, Portal and por- Portal 1 and 2 are capital A accomplishments. Uh-huh. Uh, but yeah, Portal 1 and 2 are amazing. No, nothing bad to say about either of them. Yep. Uh, early on when uh, my wife and I were dating, what, Portal 2 was one of the games we played together. Uh, definitely uh, helps you work on your communication. <laughs> um, <laughs> if it doesn't bring you together, it'll break you up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, the um, the, uh, the guy who wrote the uh, the theme song for, I believe, the first one, the the cake song, Jonathan uh, Colton, who wrote, yeah, he also he also wrote theme songs to at the end of Portal Two and at the end of, I, I think I think like it was it, like Lego Batman or one of one of the no he wrote a new one for Portal for the Portal uh, DLC of uh, mm-hmm. Lego Dimensions he wrote a brand new that's one. what it was yeah I knew it was a Lego game but yeah he wrote a third one for Legos that for the Lego game that 
mentions Batman in it. But yeah, Jonathan Colton is, oh. uh, he's also the co-host of a game show called Ask Me Another. That was the inspiration <laughs> for the Retro Encounter game shows. Oh. oh, we got to see Jonathan Colton in concert, actually. Uh, oh, that's he, awesome. Uh, he did he did play the kick song. Oh, uh, and it was It was pretty <laughs> amazing. Um, You know, of course, it was acoustic and it was only him singing, not the... It, 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 was, it was not the studio version, but still, I, I, that definitely counts. <laughs> yep. I really... um enjoyed uh portal two i've actually never gone back and played one do it i've only played two you should you should go um, back and play portal one it's uh it's like it's like, it's like five <laughs> I, hours you can beat that thing in an afternoon oh i'm sure um portal two has just very good puzzles and it's also paced very well too it actually has a, a little bit of a narrative to it mm-hmm. um and it has like two or three distinct uh halves or parts uh, I like the I like the writing a lot. I like J.K. Simmons uh, and the voice actors for Glados and um, what what's the Wheatley, other? Wheatley, Wheatley voiced by Steve Wheatley, Wheatley. Yeah, Wheatley. Yep. Um, and just the way that the story uh, goes halfway through is, is is a really cool twist. I thought I'm not going to say what it is or anything. Um, I really hope that they that Valve themselves will go back and revisit the franchise like every other franchise that they have that they have yet to revisit yeah they're making way making way too much money on dota 2 to care about almost anything else i know like the only what the only franchise of theirs that they update not in numbered sequels but they update half-life quite uh often or relatively yeah, often not but enough I, like people have been crying about half-life 2 episode uh, 3 for way longer than about a potential portal 3 but. i i just i just feel like portal gets it, it needs more. <laughs> I want more Portal. I'll go back and play the first one at some point. But. They do reference Portal. I mean, when they first released a lot of their VR tools, uh, their one of their first, uh, some of their first like demos and like uh, and uh, test things were was set in Aperture Laboratories. So and in Aperture Science. So they are referencing and they are doing things. It seems to me that Portal Three. I don't even have VR, but if they're going to be releasing. A Portal Three, it's got to be on VR. That's just an astoundingly or Portal game. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, ha- ha- Half Life Alex was one of the better VR experiences that's been made. So Valve is definitely <sighs> in, in, interested in VR, and a, 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 a Portal game in VR makes sense. But I have no idea what the timeline for that would it be. It sounds no. like it will make. I think it'll be a game that'll make a lot more. Uh, people motion sick than other VR games just because of the concept of the game. A lot of falling, yeah. I mean, they could make it work if they tried, and I sure hope they do release another Portal game in one way or another. I mean, pretty much, Portal 1 was yeah, definitively one of the funniest games to this day that I've ever played. Oh god, it's Portal fun. 2 has been one of the definitive... Um, co-op experiences back when i still had my ps3 and even now on pc with my friends that i play with sometimes and it is yeah it's just fantastic i feel like the co-op is just it's it feels it's so well like handcrafted so such perfectly made for co-op like when you like there's so many puzzles where it's like wow this is made perfectly for co-op like i can't think of a better word and yeah, I just love the. I just love how all the puzzles are so. There's so much thought put into them, and I can really feel that as I yeah, as I also like work my brain trying to solve them. Yeah, there's nothing that makes me feel quite like a genius as figuring out a really tough puzzle in Portal. And also, I gotta say, just the last thing I want to say about this game is that we were talking about some of these characters. I would argue that Chell is one of the great silent protagonists. Uh, because there's an entire, it's not just she's silent because, you know, they don't want to write dialogue for her. She's being silent because she is way too stubborn and she refuses to talk to GLaDOS. That is like canonically, she just refuses to talk. And I think that is a hilarious character choice. Well, GLaDOS multiple times says that uh, Chell's a little bit chunky and that's just rude. So so, so <laughs> Ch- Chell will not dignify that with a response. <laughs> Okay, if we are uh, talking about the appropriateness of discussing the weight of others in the room, I think it's time to move to a a, a different sort of mm, 
we're, we're not not a million miles away from Bioshock, a game with zombies and horror elements that and a lot of production value and critical acclaim. Abe, tell us about The Last of Us. It's uh, it's pretty different from, from Bioshock, really. Uh, it, yes, <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, I was I was looking for any segue I could find. Yeah, that's a nice try. The Last uh, of Us? No, no, no. It, Big Daddy and Little Sister. Perfect. <laughs> uh, well, uh, there you go. <laughs> That's a good segue. Yeah, the, yeah. The Last of Us is Bioshock Two QED. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so yeah, I think the um, for the Last of Us, you play the uh, you play the first game for the story, and you play the second one for the gameplay. Um, so uh, uh, the Last of Us kind of uh, it's weird to say, but it kind of snuck up on me. Um, you know, it's, it's obviously a big AAA game, but um, you know. Uh, the Walking Dead TV show came out in 2010, and uh, after that, there was you know the big resurgence, and everything was everything was zombies. You even got your like you know Jane Austen novels with zombies. You had uh, Capcom adding a second zombie series, and you, you even got a Yakuza <laughs> zombie game. Um, we don't talk about that. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it kind of snuck up on me to be honest. Um, I wasn't. You know, when Naughty Dog announced that they're making a zombie game, I was not really looking forward to Uncharted with zombies. <laughs> um, but uh, I got, like, when I bought my PS4, I got a free code for the PS4 version of the game, even though it came out on th- PS3 originally. And I didn't have any other games to play <laughs> for the PS4 at the time, so I, you know, booted it up. And yeah, I mean, the the first game, it kind of is Uncharted with zombies. It's That's not not wrong to uh to describe it that way but um yeah i you know talking about big uh big brother <laughs> uh and such um yeah the uh the story with um you know an old gruff guy uh you know losing his family and then uh teaming up with a, a younger girl to uh try to survive the zombie apocalypse it i mean the <laughs> those stories of the old guy and the the young person always always get me <laughs> um and uh yeah uh so i mean it was okay and it was have and you know it was kind of uncharted like it, you know it kind of moved uh sort of on rails you know you're only going forward um it you know when you're talking about zombie games you do um you do get into stealth gameplay a little bit and it does in this game too and i you know i already said that you know i enjoy the stealth gameplay so um but then the Last of Us Two was was an interesting case because it was, you know, it's it's not like the, it's not that like the story is, is told poorly, but it, it's it's a little bit misguided. Um, uh, you know, they uh, they they bring in this uh, this anti revenge message, and then you know, they give you this great gameplay that makes killing people so much fun. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, there was a. Uh, you know, unlike the the sort of uncharted style gameplay of the first game, uh, it, it puts it puts you in these levels that are, that are so much more open. Uh, you have so many weapons and 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 munitions and and such to uh, to dispatch them with. It puts you in these you know these levels with uh, where you had to fight human enemies and zombies at the same time. Uh, you know, one of my favorite things to do was uh, was a th- you know throw a Molotov cocktail at. Uh, at one of the humans and watch the, the zombies swarm them and then, you know, just clean up after, <laughs> uh, after they were all done fighting each other. Um, but yeah, so, um, and, uh, the last of us two, I think has, uh, one of the better representations for LGBT people and, and, uh, especially in triple a games. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you can name another big game where you play the game as a lesbian and then, I mean, you know, it's 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 one of the the few AAA games where it could where there's actually a trans character. So, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, I I know the the series has it has some issues, but um, yeah, I, I really enjoy <laughs> Uncharted with zombies. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> um, I really enjoyed the, the gameplay of Uncharted and um, Last of Us, especially to me. Uh, is a bit uh, hit or miss. I enjoyed uh, the gameplay of Last of Us 2 more than one, just because it was their more recent game. They've gotten more used to their uh, shooting mechanics in Last of Us. Um, 
but I enjoyed the story of one a lot more than two. Um, I did not think two story was all that good. The characters were good. It's just that the, the circumstances uh, that they were put in that I didn't really like. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, some of the interactivity within the combat spaces uh, with throwing a Molotov cocktail at a human and then having all the, the zombies go over to the human. That's one of the things that I liked a lot about um, one and especially two was I felt like I had more options to deal with uh, all the combat spaces or I could just avoid them entirely in uh, two's case at points. Um, that's what I think other than the story of one, that's what I uh, enjoy most about the last of us games was the, um, the approachability to some of the combat spaces in the game, especially two. The last of us one was, I feel it was one of the last games released on PS3, I think. And unfortunately I, I, I haven't gotten around to playing um, either of the games, but the last of us one was definitely probably one of the most enjoyable playthrough watching sessions I've had. Like I just, it was it was a twenty hour movie for me, basically, and I enjoyed every minute of it almost. Uh, I think the second game also has maybe like the most one of the more positive visions of like post apocalyptic society. Uh, it, it, you know, it, you have a, a coming of people who generally just kind of get along together, <laughs> and uh, you know, bigotry is is uh, is actually seen as you know something worth kicking someone out of the colony for sort of i haven't played either one of the games i bought the first one it's on my ps5 to be played at some point in the future but i have to admit that the discourse about the last of us 2 has actively put me off playing either game in the series and i'm not talking about whether you you know everyone on here whether you like it or dislike it or like or dislike the story uh it's one of those situations where a large portion of the internet got in their corner and the other side was evil and wrong and didn't have any right to their opinion. Uh, it was, it, it's one of those, con- it's one of those internet conflicts, which I just was kind of like, I don't really want to get involved in this, yeah. even with yeah, my it, own it, opinion it, it, in my own head. Um, so I yeah. sort of didn't, I decided just not to play the first game. At some point I probably will because I own it and yeah, I've heard it's an extremely good game. Um, and then I'll make the choice to play the second, but yeah, I don't know. It's just, Something about the discourse has left a bad taste in my mouth about the series, and I think that's a real shame. Yeah, The Last of Us 2 community writ large is extremely toxic, which is unusual because the game had a lot of critical acclaim and a lot of fan acclaim, and you, you'll see very smart people on the internet speak very highly of it, but if you go onto something like The Last of Us subreddit or a Last of Us large community forum or something, and it will just be disgusting, just, just the absolute worst. So I, I don't want to judge it for that i wouldn't going to judge it because as we've established before i don't like stealth games and i have tried to play i i tried yeah. to play the last of us um multiple times i have it i have it on ps4 the, the remastered version and i tried to play it oh boy I'm, I'm i'm gonna get wrong years wrong i think like for a while in 2019 and then for a while in 2021 and both times i just i i just i just did not like playing it i i uh I, I, I don't gravitate to zombie stuff. My list of horror games I love is very short. Bioshock is on that list and Last of Us isn't. And I don't really like a lot of stealth gameplay. So I own Last of Us 1, but not 2. And I, I haven't gotten a, a probably further than hour 3 or 4 because I just, I, just, I just wasn't interested. But that is definitely a me problem and not a Last of Us problem. In, in regards to um, Last of Us 2's story and just um character choices it's hearing about it out of context um which is where most of the internet discourse lied it it was much better in context but for me i feel like the story of two took a few risks and i don't think any of them particularly paid off all that well um one of these risks was leaked way early um but honestly, I think in the grand scheme of things, certain events kind of got a little bit too much hate uh, for thrown at Naughty Dog. Um, and it's kind of unfortunate, honestly. It's, it's a game. It's a piece of art. I don't think you need to thrash people for it. But 
Yeah, I agree. Uh, and uh, the, be, just because you don't like something doesn't mean you're th- – it. that's what really drives me crazy. I hate Star Trek Discovery, for example, but – Whenever I look online about the reasons why people hate Star Trek Discovery, I'm like, oh, I don't agree with any of these reasons. Uh, I don't like the current seasons of Doctor Who, and I am a huge Doctor Who fan. But when I look at the reasons why people hate the current seasons of a series of Doctor Who, I'm like, wow, that's really disgusting and horrifying. And I hate the fact that I, on the surface, share your opinion, but not for the reasons that you're saying. Um, That's just the internet. And sometimes... The internet is a horrible, horrible place where I wish that I could hide from it, but it's very difficult when you are, uh, you know, you're trying to follow gaming news and things like that because it's sort of, you know, the, our job. For, for me, it's like, I appreciate, um, Neil and company doing these major, major things and trying to really shake the, the story of the established characters and new characters up. I just don't feel like I don't, I don't hate the choices. I just don't think these choices uh, were justified, but you see a lot of, a lot of outspoken hate about them. And I'm like, I don't think it's deserved in that regard. Though. Yeah. From what I've heard in many places, they, it, they didn't stick the landing of the choices and mm, yeah. that's yeah. fine, but that's not a failure of the choices themselves. In fact, from what I've heard, some of the storytelling decisions were like, wow, that's really smart. That turns everything on its head. I mean, you know, I, I can also understand it's it's not the most appealing thing to uh, play a game about a, a virus taking over society at, at this point in human history. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah, that's, that's really unfortunate timing. So I could understand that. That's my last thought. The last of my thoughts. All right. Well, that was the last of our thoughts on The Last of Us. Uh, this is the easiest transition I ever have to make. Uh, Steven, your uh, pick for the round two was Uncharted. So let's go on to... <laughs> let, let, let's move. I honestly... Let's move. The Last of Us Without Zombies. Yeah. Let's, I, <laughs> well, uh, you, you say that, but a couple Uncharted games have Nazi zombies in them. So, oh. <laughs> uh, so uh, Steven, let's, uh, let's you know talk about... Um, Let's see. What is it? it, it uh, Indiana Drake or Man Raider, as it were. <laughs> so let me preface this with, I don't know how you did not come to Abe and I to switch topics. <laughs> I, I, I didn't. There, because... you, you didn't pick the same topic, so I decided to let it go. Well, these are just, they're both by the same developer and they, um, you know, zom- zombies inclusion or not, they share a lot of... Um, like gameplay philosophies with each other. Uh, granted, Uncharted's more um, frantic. It's a lot more frantic than uh, Last of Us usually is. Um, I am a passive fan of the trilogy. I came on board with um, the Nathan Drake collection on PS4. Um, and Bluepoint did an amazing job with those remasters. Uh, in that sense, I don't think the PS3 games aged all that well, but they still have this really cool uh indiana jones-esque movie quality to them the first three games at least i'll talk about four and lost legacy in a second um but i think they also offer a bit of um a good challenge uh and it's a different kind of challenge than what last of us offered where it's more um it's a lot more chaotic uh and um situational in that way uh uncharted 3 came um, after Last of Us won, I don't know. I think the two teams were different. Um, but what I'm just trying to say is it's two interesting halves. I think I prefer the Uncharted half more on the gameplay side, um, especially because uh, the accessibility options, especially recently, have been very good uh, for all of their games. Um, and then beyond the original trilogy... I honestly think that four and lost legacy are leaps and bounds better (laughs) than the, than the first three games. I really enjoyed four. It was Neil Druckmann's take on these characters. Um, And I think he portrayed or he wrote them uh, better than the trilogy did. I think the trilogy was uh, much more popcorn style, uh, Indiana Jones inspired games but I think the fourth game uh, took that and added a lot more character depth to it while also making the games uh, more open than the original trilogy was because it was just like Last of Us 1. 
limited by the PlayStation 3. It was more of a corridor type of game series before. Um, and then Lost Legacy is that open area that 4 had but blown up by 2. That was where most of the game took place. And, and Lost Legacy took um, the best character from Uncharted 2 and the best character from yes. Uncharted 4. Yeah, Chloe. And, and, I love then, Chloe. Chloe's yeah, a great just, character. It just had a... <laughs> You know, the, the the two best female leads in the series just banter for uh, eight hours, and it was it was a great decision. Absolutely, I um, my favorite character, I think, um, outside of um, uh, Nathan, Elena, and Sully is Chloe in the whole series. I think she's a fantastic character, and I'm glad that she got her own uh, time in the spotlight again. Because I don't think before Last Legacy came out, we would ever see that character again. So I'm very glad that we did. Yeah, she's only in Uncharted Three for like five minutes, which is de- def- Was she? I don't even. No, know she was that. in that. She was at the heist at the beginning, and then that was it. She was in the. That so, was so, it. So, so wow. She was in maybe two huh. missions early on in Uncharted Three, and then that was it. But she's a. Yeah. But she's she's a dominating force in Uncharted Two, and it was awesome seeing her again in Lost Legacy. Yeah, one of the two two last things. Um, one of the reasons why I like Four and Lost Legacy more is because I like that for these two games they removed the um, or largely abandoned, except for the multiplayer, uh, the supernatural elements. <laughs> um, it was more uh, grounded in that sense, which I appreciated more. And um, I can't wait to play the collection that at time of recording is going to come out in two weeks. So um, I have a lot of Uncharted thoughts. I got a PS3 in 2009 and Uncharted Drake's Fortune came with it. So it was uh, literally the first PS3 game I played, although I played it a couple when it was, uh, I think Uncharted 2 was already out when I played Uncharted 1. Um, and a, a small correction, Stephen. Uncharted Three did come out before Last of Us. Uh, they, they were uh, Uncharted Three was 2011, and Last of Us was 2013. Oh, okay. Um, All right. But uh, you're, I, but I do agree with several of your points. Um, Uncharted One through Three were basically sort of corridor shooting set piece puzzle set piece corridor, with maybe some of the, those three uh, those three categories shuffling around a little bit until the end of the game. And they are kind of, they do sort of like start out as a genuinely interesting cinematic treasure hunting story that eventually dissolves, devolves into supernatural nonsense. Like uh, w- w- without, um, without spoiling it too much, it's like, Oh, it turns out that the little, l- the legend of El Dorado was really zombies. Like, <laughs> like, and, and, <laughs> a, and twists, not that dissimilar to that one in all three of those games. Um, and, yeah. uh, and they're exciting and fun to play through once, but it is really, it's really a bit of a roller coaster ride. It's, it's sort of in and out. And unless you really want to collect um, uh, like magic, Eye, find the relic, then the, I don't think there's a ton of value um, revisiting them or it's, ter- or it's terribly, it's not that interesting re-experiencing those gameplay bits. Although some of them are really good. Like I, like I love the temples and puzzle stuff in uncharted Two. But Uncharted 4, I think, is the best one. Uncharted 4 makes the, like, it gives you bigger areas to explore. The climbing and the shooting is as good as it's ever been. And things like the, like the pirate treasure puzzles go really, and the, and the racing segments are fun and go really interesting places. And uh, it almost feels like they're telling a joke because they have, uh, they have the two most prolific male voice actors of the, of their generation voicing brothers. It's a, uh, it's a uh, Nolan North and, uh, yeah, and, and Troy Baker voicing brothers together. Uh, and, uh, and, and again, like Sam is a great intro, uh, addition to the cast. It's a, uh, it's, it's a great Sully game. Although I think, I think, I think Uncharted three is maybe Sully's finest hour, but, uh, like it's in, in terms of performances and gameplay changes and how beautiful the game is, Uncharted 4, I think, is the pinnacle of the series. And Lost Legacy was sort of made in the mold of Uncharted 4, but starring two of the best NPCs from older Uncharted games. We, I, we, I, we mentioned Chloe from Uncharted 2 as one of them. And, uh, and which makes, I, I, don't, I don't know if Lost Legacy is, is uh, as good as the heights of Uncharted 2, but the, the later Uncharted games are sort of best in class for that series. And, 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 and uh, maybe it's because it was the first PS3 game I played and I genuinely enjoy a somewhat un- uncomplicated 
three uh, third person action game once in a while, but I, I've played all five of those. I, I never played the Vita game, um, and and enjoyed all of them. I think I don't know if 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 uh, all of them are worth a full seventy bones on PS Five or whatever, but they're uh, they are worth playing if you go in with the right expectations and just like this is a popcorn ass eight hour video game times five. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Agreed on that. Also, I don't really have much to add here, but I have to say Uncharted 4 has possibly one of the best 30-second trailers ever made. In It's called um, A Man Behind the Treasure. And it's... It is... Like, I don't have... like I Currently, I don't have a PS4, but I really... Like, just watching this trailer just makes me want to go out and get one <laughs> right now. So, yeah. And you know, as a one aside... um. I, I don't remember every detail about uh, Lost Legacy, but the first four Uncharted games um, highlight three of the best lost treasure real life stories. Because uh, uh, the first one is uh, El Dorado, the second one's Shambhala, the third one is Irem of the Pillars, and the fourth one is Libertalia, the the the, the pirate utopia. And those are three real, uh, four real legendary places that could inspire an Indiana Jones. Uh, or Tomb Raider like adventure, and I thought I thought that was cool, like bringing a little bit of nonfiction into the, this very fictional but but overall pretty fun uh, series. So the treasure of uh, Lost Legacy is the tusk of Ganesh. I don't know a whole lot about the. I knew, uh, I knew it was Indian and tying into the heritage of of both protagonists, yeah. but I, I forget the name of it. I'm sorry. Um, I don't know a whole lot about the the history and background of um, you know the the real world past or like mythos in india um but i think that um it wasn't a very good MacGuffin, but it made for a very good setting to have it be um from because i really enjoyed the explorable area in lost legacy i like any conversation where someone gets to say MacGuffin. <laughs> 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 i mean really that was what that's kind of what these this series is it's a series of trying to track down MacGuffins. I mean, I mean, look, look, we all play video games. We, we have tracked down many a MacGuffin over the years. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> I, I, I had yep. to, I had to five the five, I had to find the five master core MacGuffins in tales of uh, rise. Not, not 21 days ago. Um, <laughs> y- yeah. I, I, again, I don't want to, I, I don't want to make this sound like a negative, but the, I think the uncharted games are sort of empty calories, action games, but a lot of the time, but I also feel the same way about like a lot of action movies, action movies that I love and revere even. And, and these are just really beautiful, fun versions of those. But, I'm, is, but none of them are going to show up on my top 10 favorite games uh, list that I can concoct. Like if you can get these at a reasonable price and know what you're getting into, they're awesome. But if you're expecting like a, uh, a meaty RPG or a uh, or an action game with a lot of customization and and precision. That's not these. If you want something that's beautiful and fun and has snappy dialogue, and you and you can be in and out in like in like three evenings of playtime, then that, that's exactly what these are. And uh, and I, I think Uncharted Four is the best one, but they're all worth playing. Yeah, and Uncharted Four is uh, the longest as well. I think that one averages around. Um... 12 to 16 oh, probably I'd, I'd have to check how long to beat but they they don't they they, they feel yeah. like short ish experiences yeah the first three are definitely you can beat in a couple yeah but, but as rpg games. players all five of us are long are used to some long ass games and and uh <laughs> yeah and uh yeah. yeah exactly and final fantasy 14 this ain't <laughs> uh, but yeah if you if you treat them as kind of what they are being like um fast-paced uh, popcorn action flick games, I think you'll have a good time. All right. Well, that is a discussion of 10 games or kinds of games or series that are definitely not RPGs. So listeners, I hope you found this entertaining or illuminating or, at, or you know, however you felt it. Thank you for joining us for this over two hour epic discussion of <laughs> 10 things that aren't RPGs. And those things were uh, Capcom fighting games, Hollow Knight, Remedy Studio games, Metal Gear Solid games, Tetris Effect, customizable and deck building card games, 
Bioshock series, the Portal series, the Last of Us series, and the Uncharted series. Uh, all of those are worth playing or worth checking out. If you were unfamiliar with any of the ones we discussed, but they sound interesting, then you are a few Google searches away from trying them for yourselves. But uh, let I have before we move on to housekeeping, I have one final thing I want to spring on you guys. Uh, I'm going to keep this short to 30 seconds each or so. If you could recommend one game from the games you discussed in your segments tonight, what for a uh, an audience that plays video games but hasn't played any of these, what would it be? I will go first. Uh, I think that uh, listeners should go, if they are interested in that discussion on deck building games that we had a little while ago, I would recommend trying out Monster Train. Monster Train is a deck, is a deck building card game where you are a, a group of demons trying to... Uh, trying to get the last flame of hell to the middle of hell because you've lost a war to the angel angels and hell has frozen over frozen over it, it, it's really fun and colorful and once you grasp the rules it is just it is just really fun to do a 30 minute run of it and I have uh, I've unlocked a lot of stuff in it but I have not gotten anywhere near uh, the end of the depth of that game can confer so if you're interested in a cartoony heaven versus hell card game, uh, uh, Monster Train comes highly recommended. Uh, Dom, what's the one game you would recommend from the set you talked about tonight? Yeah, if you're vaguely interested in or have like Souls likes, then Hollow Knight is 100% a game you should try out. It perfectly encapsulates that vibe and it has its own twists to it. And it is a fantastic game to play as well. And it is amazing value on Steam. What's there not to like? Perfect. And Jono? Uh, Portal. It's one of the greatest video games ever made. Uh, it's incredibly clever. It's pitch perfect funny. Uh, and you can get it insanely cheap on any Steam sale. It's well worth it at full price, but if you get it on Steam sale, you can get it really, really cheap. Just buy it. Just buy it offhand. Play it when you feel like it. you're in for a treat. Yeah, log in, add it to your wish list, and then buy it when it's $3 or less because it'll. it's probably just a matter of weeks. Now, Abe, same question. Uh, because of availability, I would say Metal Gear Solid Five. Um, if you can track down the first one, uh, if it ever becomes available anytime soon, um, I would recommend going with that. But you know, Five is available, and and it's a great game, and it's you know a fun sandbox to play with, and it still incorporates all the quirky Hideo Kojima ness of of the series. And that'll just make you one more player that has to um, demilitarize all of your nukes before the world can see the true ending. <laughs> that's, that's, right. that, that's never going to happen uh, listeners yeah. if you don't if you don't know what that means look it up because i'm not going to explain it here uh but but uh <laughs> steven what's your pick for one game among the set you talked about today so if you're in the mood for a uh visual treat of a classic uh puzzle game i would recommend tetris effect especially if you have um an oculus quest 2 or a psvr or a other pc headset um, this is a fantastic get. Uh, it's probably one of my favorite VR games that I have played so far. And um, it's got modern Tetris flair with some really cool visual stylings. All right. So there's our discussion followed by our recommendations. And now it's time to end the episode. Listeners, thank you so much again for joining us for this journey. But I, I forgot to thank my panelists. Thank you, Dom, Jono, Abe, and Steven for um talking about things that aren't RPGs for once on a podcast. And it's been a double thank you to Abe and Steven for making your retro encounter debuts today. Woo-hoo. Thanks for having me. <laughs> but let's, uh, now that we've ta- had some newcomers on the show, let's go back to the retro regulars next week. We are doing, and the week after we are doing episodes on skies of Arcadia, the dreamcast classic later ported to GameCube, And either of those is an, one of the best RPGs of the late nineties, early two thousands. I love skies of Arcadia. I'm not going to be on those episodes because I loaned my copy of skies of Arcadia to one of the panelists, but uh, th- that game is excellent. And I cannot wait to hear the discussion uh, starting next week. But uh, later on in, in 2022, in February, we are doing two episodes on Star Wars, Knights of the Old Republic, the 2003 Xbox and PC game made by Bioware when, were, when they were near or at the peak of their powers. Uh, it, it's, I, I, it's not an old Infinity Engine game, but it's sort of when they were moving on from Infinity Engine game to whatever Mass Effect and Dragon Age would end up being. 
but it's a it's a, a very celebrated uh, Western RPG and Star Wars game, and I'm really excited to play it for the first time for the podcast. And uh, because we're only a few weeks away from those episodes, I probably should start the damn thing. But uh, uh, before I start the damn thing, I'm going to finish the playthrough of The Dark Pictures Little Hope that Peter Treason- Treasonberg and I have been doing off and on for the past couple of weeks. I, I don't play a lot of horror games, so uh, Peter may uh, make fun of me for being a giant baby on that podcast when we record it, but we are playing The Dark Pictures Little Hope, and this is a semi-sequel to the Until Dawn episode that Peter and I recorded a couple of years ago. So for a, a horror diversion for Retro Encounter, uh, please listen for the Little Hope episode coming in February. But uh, that's enough for the future of Retro Encounter. If you want to message us about the present or future of Retro Encounter, you can email retro at rpgfan.com. Also visit rpgfan.com's message boards, our Facebook page, our Discord server, our Twitch channel, our Twitter account. All of those are called RPG Fan or RPG Fan Com. Something streaming every day on Twitch. Usually it's Scott, but uh, sometimes uh, Steph or Max makes a cameo appearance. We also have three other fine podcasts on RPG Fan. There's Random Encounter, hosted every two weeks, mostly about randomness, mostly starring John O'Logan. Hello. And also Rhythm Encounter every other two weeks, mostly hosted by Meg Salvato and always about RPG music. There's also Phoenix Edge, our partner podcast hosted by Hat and Eric. They're on hiatus right now, but they will be coming back in 2022. And their topics of discussion are usually RPGs and RPG current events. You can review Retro Encounter or those three other fine podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, whatever you choose. Give us feedback. We love feedback. Five stars preferred. And if you want to give us five star feedback as individuals, let's share our social media with the listeners starting with you Jono. okay you can find me at Jono underscore logan on twitter you can also send me an email at j logan at rpgfan.com or if you want to send something about random encounter you can send it to podcast at rpgfan.com now abe the uh, best way to find me is on twitter it's uh at, at babe moby uh b-a-b-e-m-o-b-y now dom uh, you can find me hanging out in the Discord most of the time under the handle of DH Kenny. Now, Steven. You can find me on Twitter at Steven Mattern Zero, no spaces, no underscores. Um, and uh, you can find my music reviews and news coverage on RPGFan.com. And for me, listeners, you've heard me say this possibly over 200 times. I'm Mike Solosi. I'm easiest to find on Twitter. I am at the Real Monsoon most of the time, at Evoker for Dogs other times, and on the RPG Fan Discord, I am Monsoon Mike. But all right, this did give me some more games to play. I'm wondering if I should uh, give Bioshock Infinite another chance, or see if uh, my PS5 can run Control okay. I have a lot of questions, but none of them are about RPGs. Thank you. Good night, and good luck. <laughs> <laughs>